Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about the Chilling App. It's actually been quite a while since I think I've talked to you guys about the Chilling App, and because it's been such a long time, the Chilling App has evolved quite a bit. If you guys want to check it out, of course, it's available on your phones, iOS and Android, Google Play Store and all that, but you can also head over to ChillingApp.com. I think before I told you guys to head over to ChillingApp.com to look at maybe contests or something that they would be offering there as incentives to download, but now, oh my god, <laughs> there's two different categories. There's Chilling that is available in audio and Chilling that's available in video. You can now watch some of your favorite horror movies from classics to horror comedies to, god, even a whole bunch of anthology series that are available for you to watch on the Chilling app. Uh, you also have your classics, such as audio as well. If you guys want to hear some podcasts, if you guys want to hear horror stories with the ability to customize your own background sounds and music, or if you just want to listen to some audiobooks, they're all available now on the Chilling app. If it's something that you checked out when I worked with them before, uh, and you haven't checked them out since, I, I really suggest you do so, because you've been missing out on quite a bit. And still, they have some of your favorite narrators on there as well, such as Autumn Ivy, Your Maker, and Mr. Creeps, as well as stories from yours truly. Speaking of stories from yours truly that are available in the app, this is one such story that you can find on the Chilling app. If you guys want to check it out, links to it will be in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. What Color Are the Walls? By Corpse Child. $10,000 to anyone who can correctly tell us what color the walls are that's what the sign said the white sign with black letters see i can still tell you what color that is i can tell you that as well as the color of the building the sign was plastered over it very dingy gray it was about as depressing as the cloudy sky when i saw it that day i still remember how gray everything was around me like like if all the color was engulfed by the gray depressing hue of the overcast I remember these things, these colors. I know they stay the same, but that room, I I truly don't know anymore. For God's sake, I don't even know if I'm even in the real world anymore, if I'm still somewhere in the damn room. It's been only a few hours now since I participated in the experiment. It was a week ago when I first saw the sign. I was walking home from another day, essentially wasted behind my desk at the office typing out budget plan after budget plan just to make sure that glorified chimp in a three-piece tux would finally quit cracking his bullwhip over me about the numbers not being satisfactory or not enough profit being ground out from this or some happy horse shit like that. Mr. Ivan, Ivan the Ape, or Monkey Ivan. Those are what a few bold and rather hyper-pissed-off co-workers called him behind his back. It wasn't the color of his skin, his ghoulish, pale, albino skin that earned him this nickname, funny enough. No. No, it was how the bastard couldn't seem to know how to use anything newer than Windows XP, much less run the company of an aspiring tech brand. Yet he'd still beat his chest in a huff if every little detail wasn't to his liking. Just imagine an albino Donkey Kong in a suit. You can have just about an accurate enough picture of Mr. Ivan. Anyway, I say this to say that my day was already circling the drain as usual, and with the way things were going, I, I didn't figure it would be long before he or corporate one found some way to cut me loose. That's, of course, when I found the sign. A big white sign with bold black letters. At first... I was confused as all hell. Ten grand just to guess the color of the walls? My mind went through every possibility of there being some kind of catch, as well as what guessing the color of the room even meant. Was it some sort of game where the room would be covered by curtains and have to guess which one would be which color? None of it made sense, but I guess an easy 10,000 in my situation must have been too good a deal to pass up, and I went inside. Like I said earlier, the building was depressing, colorless on the outside. The inside, on the other hand, was the polar opposite. For the first 30 feet or so, the walls of the narrow corridor were like one of those blended color spectrums that you see on paint programs. As they went on, I saw them twist into different patterns, similar to a kaleidoscope. I guess the first weird thing I noticed 
or at least the first overtly strange thing was how the colors on the wall sort of morphed into the new designs. What I mean by that is for so long, the walls were one specific way and were very subtly sort of mold in a way you probably wouldn't notice at first. By the time your brain does catch on that, hey, something's different here, you're now wondering if the walls weren't like that the entire time. I know that's how it was for me anyway. It must have shown, too, because the next thing I knew, I was snapped from a daze by a man wearing a purple button-up and khaki slacks. Strange, isn't it? The effects of colors. He sounded excited when he asked this, like he'd been practicing for some big sales pitch based on this. Uh, sure, if you say so, I replied with a nervous chuckle. He stifled the giggle of his own as he watched me steal about two more glances of the walls. I heard him sigh in an almost condescending manner and put his arm on my shoulder, making it look like we were two art buffs gawking at Renaissance paintings in a studio. Yes, sir, you'd be surprised just how much color has an effect on our lives. More specifically, on our minds. Hell, without color. <laughs> well... I'd say that we'd all go stark raving nuts. He ended this pitch with a little excited chuckle. But then again, he continued, what if color itself could make you go nuts, huh? I mean, think about it. Color gives dimension to the world. It's what makes everything around us recognizable. You know, without it, nothing would have any features or definition to it. Everything would be all unrecognizable or unconceivable without color. I just nodded, looking like a bobblehead while he railed on about the evolution of colors, and their effects on the mind through history, and crap like that. Partly because of the utterly bizarre nature of the walls still holding my attention. As well as the guy's rambling, surrounding like something of a college professor would spout at a seminar. I paid little to no attention to what the hell he was saying. Yeah, yeah, Picasso, we get it. Color is the secret of life, or whatever. I joked, but looking back now, I might have been more prepared for the shit I'm knee-deep in now if I'd paid better attention. Finally, I was snapped from another daze when I felt him give me a clap on the back, saying, Yes, sir! Color has shaped our world! But now back to my earlier question, what if there was no color? What would you see? What would you do in the absence of color? I shrugged. I, I don't know. His hyper-enthusiastic grin widened almost painfully, and his big brown eyes widened, fully exposing the small red veins around them. Well, how would you, sir, like to find out? I just stood there, frozen, not really sure what I was supposed to say. Being completely honest here, I was utterly mind-fucked with everything in that moment, that despite wanting nothing more than to haul ass out of this little bizarro funhouse, I just couldn't seem to move or speak or even think straight for that matter. Fortunately, I guess, his question didn't seem to require an answer because he immediately launched into his pitch about this experiment they're doing to test the mind's stability in the absence of color. Our hypothesis, he stated, is that in an environment devoid of colors, shapes, or anything, you won't be able to tell what's real anymore, hence our pitch. Ten large to the first person to prove this hypothesis false. I looked stupidly at him. So basically it's sensory deprivation? I suppose you could look at it that way. Pretty mild way of saying it in my opinion, but to each their own. Well, how exactly am I supposed to look at it? He continued grinning, looking almost maniacal now. As a test, sir, the ultimate test of both your senses as well as your mind to see just how far it can be stretched literally no stimuli at all. He then winked and asked, What do you say? With almost no thought, I scoffed and told the guy to blow it straight out of his ass before striding towards the door I came from. I was about four feet from the door when he caught up to me, stopping me. Wait, he said, thrusting his hand in my chest. I saw it was a little silver business card reading in bright blue letters, Brainstorm LLC, where only the mind grants you power. Just consider it. I stuffed the card in my pocket and pushed my way past him and out the door. I walked the rest of the way to my apartment, albeit with a more 
agitated and nervous stride. My mind was swimming all night with the whole thing, robbing me almost completely of sleep and continuing still into the next morning. Because of this, I was barely functional at work. What was worse was that it was the due date of Quarter 3's sales reviews, which in turn earned me a grade A ass chewing out from the old Monkey Ivan. In the end, I was told to go home early that day and told not to come back for another five days. Unpaid leave. Great. fan frickin tastic Now I'm out half my next paycheck. Still needed another 35 hours for my salary. Plus, plus I was gonna turn and gun for some overtime. How fucking well. So there I was, sitting in my apartment, wishing I could down a few shots and lose myself to blissful inebriation. And just my luck, I had no more jack. Being stiffed on my next paycheck, I figured it'd be my best move to try and hold tight to what I had, despite how much I needed some kind of relief. Oddly though, much of my thought was still trapped in the whole colors situation. I can't explain it, but I found myself actually thinking more and more about what the guy was going on about, how color is what defines everything around us, how color is how we can perceive the world around us. Don't get me wrong, the guy was a complete nut job, straight out of the wacky shack, but still, something about the ways that he was saying it at the time made me legitimately wonder. What would it be like to be in a room with nothing at all, no colors? I'd heard before about sensory deprivation and how it causes people to panic, but what exactly do they see? Would it be real? And how much so? I also found myself wondering exactly which aspect it was that triggers the senses of paranoia in such instances. Of course, this would ultimately get thrown in with an overarching issue of, I need money and quick. And the next thing I knew, I was uncrumpling the card from my pocket and calling the number listed under the blue letters. It was scheduled for screening the following morning, which was basically just me filling out paperwork and waivers so that I could run to the law if shit went south during the experiment. They also debriefed me as to what the experiment was and what I'd be doing. Essentially, they rehashed what the guy in the hallway the previous day described as a test to see whether or not long-term deprivation of color, as they frequently termed it, would cause me to lose perception of what was real. They told me that my part in this was to simply stay in a certain room for about three days, and at the end, they had asked me what color the walls were. If I could answer it correctly at the time, then I'd be taken home ten large that day. Now, I won't lie here, I actually had to ask if these people were high as hell. Ten thousand dollars just to sit in a room for a few days, and then tell them what color the fucking walls were? Tell me that doesn't sound far too good to be true. Sure enough, though, they were dead serious about it. I asked if there would be any sort of gas or injections they'd be using on me, or if there'd be any kind of sounds that they'd play to stir up any kinds of effects. Nope. Nothing. In fact, they reiterated how the purpose was to see what would happen without any sort of stimuli. Just complete silent solitude for five days, memorizing the color of the walls. Even though this sounded like the easiest and most money I'd ever make in my life, I was still a bit hesitant to actually go through with it. They made it all sound so easy. Too easy. In the end, though, I told myself easy money was easy money, ludicrous or not. I was told to return the following Monday to begin the experiment and was expressly told not to bring any belongings with me, just myself and the clothes on my back. For those next two days, waiting anxiously to claim the easy win... I was admittedly still anxious as to what was going to happen during that time. I'm sorry, but like I said, that's just too easy. There had to be some kind of catch here. Catch or not, though, I was, I was there first thing Monday morning standing on that trippy-ass tie-dye hallway in the Brainstorm LLC building. Hello there, good to see you again, greeted by the guy from before. Are you ready to begin? Sure, ready as I'll ever be. Keep calm, I told myself. Just think of the ten grand. Excellent! He exclaimed with childlike hyper-enthusiasm. Just follow me down here and we'll get started immediately. We walked down the hallway and I noticed that same effect from before, but the further down I went and the longer I looked, the more I thought I saw the colors actually moving and shifting in different shapes, like the colors in the spectrum were alive. When we turned down another hallway, the same thing happened, only this time it was just black and yellow shapes going down. 
for whatever reason, maybe because the actual colors themselves, who knows, but I actually thought I saw the forms of bumblebees buzzing around on the walls. For just a second, I almost could have sworn I actually heard them. I was starting to get weirded out, and I didn't want to somehow fuck up my chance of the money, so I just shook my head and made sure to keep my eyes forward from that point on. And here we are, he said, reaching out to open a giant narrow metal door. Inside was an empty blank white room. I had to squint my eyes going in from even how bright it was. Or was it even lit? God, this is so confusing. This is where the experiment will take place. I looked around the room. The walls were huge, at least 30 feet high and about 40 or 50 feet wide. It seemed to be fresh drywall. So, exactly what am I supposed to do in here again? Uh, besides tell you that the walls are white. His devious grin from before returned. Anything you wish, or nothing at all. Your part is just to remain in this room for the next five days and tell us what color the walls are at the end. And the money's yours. I looked confused at him. I just told you they're white. Do I get the money now? Oh, just wait. You may not have the same answer in five days, he said with an equally devious chuckle. What about food? Or if I need to use the bathroom, what do I do then? By the time I managed to get that out, he'd already, with a rather shit-eating grin, shut the huge metal door. Yeah, great. Thanks. So there I was, standing in the middle of an empty white room, all alone. So... Now what? I was getting bored quickly, so I started feeling across the walls. Part of me wondered if I'd maybe find some sort of microphone or camera. I mean, they'd have to keep watch over me somehow, right? For research or something, but nope, nothing. Like I said, just fresh drywall. Hey, can you hear me? Anyone? Nothing. Okay, so I guess they can't hear me. I tried testing this by shrieking and howling at the top of my lungs like a deranged hyena. Still nothing. So they can't see me. And they aren't listening. But how are they experimenting then? How if they're not taking any sort of notes or anything like that? That's when I thought back to what they told me. That all I had to do was stay in the room for three days and tell them that the walls are white. But maybe I'm thinking too much into it here. I took a deep breath. Just keep cool. Tell them the walls are still white. And that money is as good as mine. Simple as that. I began fantasizing about the things I'd do with all that money. I mean, that's at least three paychecks right there, and all just for telling these eggheads that the walls were white. I began pretending that I was making it rain, showering in money. I mean, why not? I already found out no one was watching. That's when the first weird thing happened, though. It was while I was imagining fanning myself with a cash that I thought I could actually feel it in my hands. It was soft and thin, like money paper. I opened my eyes and of course saw nothing. It was a little odd, but I figured that I was just caught up in the moment, you know, like, you know how that goes. You get so excited about something in your mind and senses fixate on it, and all of a sudden you think it's actually there, but it's really not. Well, I thought that's what it was at first, but then... For a brief instant, I thought I actually saw dollar bills raining down from the ceiling. I rubbed my eyes, I looked again, and nothing. What the, huh? I was confused. Where was the money? I, it was there, right in front of my face. W wasn't it? Cut it out. There wasn't shit there, you know it. I yawned, I was getting tired, which I figured probably was why I thought I saw money coming from the ceiling. But that made sense. I mean, I had been in the room for... God knows how many hours, with literally nothing to do. Boredom was making me tired, which then made me think I saw money falling from above. Yeah, that's all it is. Boredom screwing with your head. Shut your eyes for a while and everything will be fine. I laid down and, surprisingly, the floor was actually comfortable. Almost as soft as the red satin sheets on my bed back home. In almost no time at all, I was falling asleep. Just before my eyes closed, however, I could have sworn I saw a giant wave of red all take up the floor. I was asleep before I could give it any further thought. 
I don't know how long I was out. It felt like I'd slept for the remainder of the experiment. When I awoke, though, you guessed it, white walls. I tried going back to sleep, but no luck. The floor didn't feel soft anymore. If anything, it felt like concrete, almost. Out of instinct, I felt around the floor and the walls. They all now felt rough and coarse, like they were made from cement. Then, the more I looked at them, the more I noticed they looked more grayish now, as opposed to their original blinding white. But how? I rubbed my eyes and looked again. White again. About a solid five minutes, I just stood staring at the wall. What's going on here? I did just see that, right? The wall was just gray, right? But how? How were the walls gray? The walls can't just change color like that. Or can they? I shook my head. Of course they can't. Stop being stupid. Walls can't change color. But I told myself this. Another thought sent my thoughts further into a frenzy. What if the color of the walls didn't actually change at all? What if they were actually gray the entire time? Maybe I was just imagining the whole thing that they were white. Look, I get it. The illusions of the money falling from the ceiling and the soft satin colored floor were one thing. I could write those off, no problem. It was just my mind playing tricks on me because of exhaustion and boredom. But this wasn't as easily passed off. I mean, I, I mean, think about it. White and gray aren't that different, right? Both are lighter colors. Gray just being the combination of white and black, of light and dark. Could the walls actually be gray? I looked around again and saw the walls still looked white. I felt them again. Still felt like common drywall. At least what I thought drywall at that moment was supposed to feel like. That was another thing. How in the hell was I feeling things that weren't there? Again, I know some of it could have just been my mind, but why or, or how was it that one moment the walls felt soft and smooth, and the next they're completely different? Unless, of course, I was only imagining that it was drywall to begin with. I started rubbing my temples, feeling the onset of headache. Fuck, man, this is ridiculous. You seriously gotta cut this shit out. The walls are white, and, and you know it. I decided I'd just keep repeating that over and over like a mantra. The walls are white. The walls are white. The walls are white. Eventually, I started feeling hungry. Hey, um, how are we doing lunch? I'm still kind of hungry in here. I knew no one was going to answer, having already established they can't listen, but I didn't know what else to do. I started imagining the taste of a thick, tender, juicy steak burger with a large side of fries. I thought of how the medium-rare beef would sting my taste bugs with a generous douse of barbecue sauce, and suddenly there it was in my hands, a soft, juicy steak burger complete with a garlic toast bun that had been baked to a perfect golden brown. For a moment, I just stared at it. My head was spinning. Where the hell did this come from? How did it come from? The pain of hunger quickly overruled logic, though, and I took a big bite out of the sandwich, or at least what I thought was a sandwich. Only after a sharp pain shot through me did I realize I'd just bitten into my hand, not a steak burger. My hand was in a lot of pain and starting to bleed. Now I was starting to get pissed. What the what the fuck was going on? How was I seeing shit? Shit that I knew damn well wasn't there, and the walls... Why were they changing colors? They're supposed to be white. There wasn't any food. There, there wasn't any cash waiting from the ceiling. There was no soft satin floors. And the fucking walls were white. Weren't they? I looked again, now seeing tiny black dots covering them. No, I knew something was up. Those, those definitely weren't there before. This did make me rethink my conclusion that they weren't watching me. Could these dots be cameras? That, that could have made sense, except then... Then how come I didn't notice them before? Even if they were hidden in the walls, I should have been able to feel them or something through the thin drywall. But then again, that's assuming that this was even drywall. When I reached out to touch one of the dots, my eyes damn near shot out of their sockets. When I see them beginning to move like a swarm of ants as my fingers passed across the wall, some of them crawling up my arm, but that wasn't possible, was it? Dots... Dots can't move. When I jerked away, though, the dots they were still again. Like they never moved. They didn't move, right? 
Dots can't move. Wait again. There were no dots either. The walls were white, blank. No dots, no satin floor, no money falling, just white. The walls were white. The walls are white. The walls are white. Eventually, this droned in my head so much that I was once again feeling sleepy. It's like before I was out before my head touched the floor. Though this time the ground was still rough and coarse instead of soft like it had been before. Also, I remember faintly seeing the tiny black dots moving again, swarming frantically around me, slowly trying to get closer and closer. I wasn't asleep for long. I remember dreaming that the dots were crawling all over me like a mound of fire ants burrowing into every orifice they could find. I felt them everywhere, inside and out. Eventually, I was blinded when they began to scuttle inside of my eyeballs, and I started choking, suffocating as more of them stuffed themselves down my throat. I woke up screaming, almost bolting straight to my feet, and started feeling myself all over. No ants or black dots or whatever the hell they were. I stood in the middle of the room, breathing heavily, trying to regain my bearings in this area around me, trying to make sure that I really was only dreaming. Of course, it didn't help that now, somehow, the dots were gone, now replaced by micro-thin black lines. By now, I was beyond trying to rack my fucking head on whether or not the dots had actually been the lines the whole time, and hell, by then, I was almost convinced that that was how the room had always been. White? Or, or was it gray? With thin black strands that looked like piano wire. But that still brings me back to the earlier question. Why hadn't I seen any of this before? How do I know this is actually how the room was from the beginning? I mean, I, I saw the fucking room, and I remember the color of the fucking walls being white. Don't I? I closed my eyes and began straining to remember the way the room looked when I first went in. Large, blank, white. Gray. Fuck! I couldn't even tell anymore if the walls were white or gray. Moreover, I couldn't really be sure they were actually blank. Maybe the dots, strands, whatever had been there from the get-go. Maybe it was like the walls in the hallway. How I thought the tie-dye colored walls were shifting, but actually weren't. That would make sense. Maybe the reason I thought the dots were ants was because that was the color I associated with ants. Basically, I pictured ants when I saw the tiny dots, so my mind made me think the dots were moving, just like how I thought the floor was soft because I imagined I was in my bed, and because I was hungry, I imagined the tan-skinned hand to be the toasted bun of the sandwich. Colors what makes everything around us recognizable, you know? I was finally beginning to understand it. I finally started understanding why the challenge was to tell them what color the walls were, because... But with this, I realized I wasn't really sure what color they were to begin with. Were they white? Were they blank? Was all that the illusion the entire time? Do they even know the color of the fucking walls? My breathing started getting heavier and heavier, feeling like I was being strangled. The next thing I knew, I saw two of the strands coiled around my neck, tightening like a noose. I began clawing at my throat to pry them loose to no purpose. Soon my vision began to blur and I was only able to let out strained wheezing. I closed my eyes and started repeating over and over in my head, they're just lines. They're just lines. They're just lines. Finally, I felt able to breathe again. Opening my eyes, the room was like it was before. White. Like maybe gray. With long, thin strands. Maybe dots. And that's when I began laughing. It wasn't a ha-ha funny shit laugh or even a, a laugh of relief. It was like... The laugh of one whose mind has been bent and twisted every which way until it finally began snapping like a twig. I couldn't take it anymore. The room, the experiment, the goddamn colors, all of it. I just, I couldn't take the mind fuck anymore. I didn't even care about the money anymore. I just, I had to get the fuck out of here. I, uh, without thinking, I bolted to where the door was or I thought it was. When I began trying to pry at the cracks of the doorway, I realized my fingers weren't grabbing anything, simply just brushing the thin black strands going down the wall. Where's the door? It was right here, wasn't it? What? Where's the fucking door? Then again, I began thinking, had that been where the door was? What, was there even a door at all? That was when I truly lost it. I began driving my head into the wall as I screamed, let me out of here. 
Let me out! Eventually, I finally blacked out again from the constant trauma, and when I woke up, God only knows how much later, I was in what looked like a hospital room. It was dark. I didn't see anyone, so I guessed it was nighttime, and my head was still fuzzy, and everything was still blurred. Feeling around, I found that I was lying in a soft bed, with thin white linen covering my legs. In my pocket, I pulled out the crumpled up Brainstorm LLC card. On the back were the words, thank you for participating in the latest Brainstorm LLC experiment. Everything was quiet. There wasn't even the beeping of an EKG machine. How did I get here? Slowly, everything started coming back to me. The lines, the dots, the money falling from the ceiling, the soft floor, the walls. That's when panic struck me like a knife. The walls, the experiment, what happened? Is it over? Did I pass or fail? How the hell did I even get out? I am out of the room, right? I, I, Jesus Christ, I don't know anymore. Am I out of the room? Am I actually in the hospital right now? Or am I just seeing what my mind is telling me or what I guess the callers are telling me is a hospital room? I don't even know if the phone I'm typing this on is real. I mean, it's a white iPhone or am I, at least that's what I'm seeing it as. But is it actually a phone? How do I know it's not just something from the room again? I need help. I need help, please. If this is real, if I'm actually in the real world now, someone please tell me. Someone give me a sign. Anything to prove I'm not in the room anymore. God, I don't know what color the walls are. I don't know what color anything really is anymore. If anyone ends up reading this, then it means I was successfully able to post it without it being taken down. Every other website and forum I've tried writing on has resulted in the same error notification being displayed, whether it's on a, on a laptop or a smartphone. I can only assume it's something that the people in charge of whatever this is has done in order to prevent anyone left from getting word out about what's happening here. Some kind of jamming device or scrambler. But for whatever reason, this site still remains accessible. And so I'm posting this here in a place that I don't think they'll ever check because someone needs to know the truth. I'm pretty sure everyone knows about the test of the emergency broadcast system that happened earlier today. I mean, it was all over the internet on the news yesterday. According to the smiling anchor man on our local channel, it would happen around 12.20 in, in the afternoon and last for about half an hour. Broadcasting on television, radio, and to every cell phone turned on at the time. The town I live in, whose name I don't dare write in case anyone monitoring the internet is using a trolling program, searching for specific names or phrases, only has a population of about 1,500 people. Because it's such a small and tight-knit community, conversations about the announcement began spreading like wildfire. Didn't they already do a test of the system less than three years ago? Old Mrs. Kravis asked the cashier at the grocery store, while I stood in line behind her with frozen pizza in my hands. I think I read something about how they're required to perform the test every three or four years, Lorna, she replied as she patiently waited for the elderly woman to finish writing out a check for her purchases. Later that night, after my parents had gone to bed, as I gorged myself on the remaining slices of pizza and watched reruns of I Love Lucy, I got a text from my friend Aubrey. If I have to hear about that stupid test one more time, I think I'll scream, it said. I let out a small chuckle and typed back, Yeah, you'd think with all the commotion over town, we'd all end up in a 21st century version of the Cuban Missile Crisis or something. After a few minutes, my phone vibrated in reply. <laughs> LOL, no joke. I was going to ask if you wanted to do some skateboarding tomorrow. You probably don't have much time left until the snow begins to fall. Hell yeah, I muttered quietly to myself, then typed out a response. I am absolutely down for that. I'll meet you in the parking lot of the diner at around 11.45. I hit send, then, then a thought occurred to me. 
I sent a quick text message before she could respond. I'm going to turn my phone off tonight and leave it at home. I don't want to have to deal with that annoying tone going off. I took a sip of coke until my eyes began to droop. Sleep was calling my name. My phone buzzed. Good idea. I'll do the same. Gonna hit the sack. Catch you later. After bidding her good night as well, I held down the power button on the phone. The Samsung logo briefly showed before going back to black. I reached for the remote and shut the TV off, dumping my dishes into the sink before heading upstairs. Tossing the power down phone onto my desk, I set my alarm clock for 10 before climbing into bed and quickly falling into a deep and dreamless sleep. In retrospect, turning off our phones and leaving them at home is probably what ended up saving our lives. At least, sparing us that horrible initial fate, anyway. In the morning, I quickly told my parents where I was heading, and after promising them that I'd be safe, I grabbed my skateboard, house keys, and jacket and headed out the front door. The chilly fall air smacked me in the face as I let gravity pull me down the residual streets towards downtown. Behind me, the Rocky Mountains rose imposingly up into the sky, seeming like the turrets of a castle fortress. There's been a rumor going for close to 40-plus years that horror writer Dean Koontz once visited here in the late 70s and ended up basing the fictional town of Snowfield on it for his novel Phantoms. I think it's a load of bullshit, though. I can't deny that our town looks very similar to what the book described. So, who knew? Looking left and right to watch out for any cars or trucks, I entered the town proper and made a beeline for the diner. Aubrey was leaning against the steps, which led to the front door. You're five minutes late, you know, she said jokingly, checking the watch on her wrist. If I had waited any longer, I would have had to organize a search party. I rolled my eyes at the lame joke and chuckled, bite me. I retorted good-naturedly, causing her to let out a laugh. No thanks. I don't think I'd like the taste of you. This time, a full-blown laugh burst out of me, which set her off more. After a few more seconds, we got control of ourselves again and straightened up. So, where do you want to go skate? She asked me. I thought for a second, looking around. The diner was packed with patrons having either lunch or a late breakfast, and the parking lot full of cars and trucks. Too risky to shred here. An idea came to me, and I snapped my fingers. The old blockbuster! It's got plenty of railings to grind, and we can kick flip over the parking lot bumps. Plus, since it's in the back of town, Sheriff Wake likely won't find us and force us to move. Aubrey rolled her eyes at the mention of the sheriff. The man had a major stick up his ass, and seemingly hated anyone skateboarding, or as he called it, creating a nuisance. Aubrey shrugged. Sure, why not? Our plan set, we tucked our boards under our arms and walked through town towards the abandoned building, which once housed the only video rental store in town. It took less than five minutes to reach it. The sign still stood at the entrance, the yellow letters long since having faded in the sun. I checked my own watch as Aubrey dropped her board to the ground and pushed off. 12.05. The test was supposed to start in about 15 minutes. I shook my head again, glad that we decided to ditch our phones for the day. For a brief moment, I remembered I'd forgotten to tell my folks I'd done so, and a small swath of guilt washed over me at the possibility they might end up worried if they tried to get a hold of me. But I pushed it out of my mind. I'd apologize when I got home. I dropped my own board to the ground and pushed off. For the next ten to twelve minutes, the two of us whooped and laughed as we jumped and grinded our way across the parking lot. All the stress of having graduated and needing to pick a college to go to fell away from my mind and I felt what I can only describe as peace. The peace was shattered by the sounds of tires screeching and steel and glass smashing against each other, reverberating off the buildings and seemingly off the mountains above us themselves. I'd been in the middle of grinding the entrance rail when it came, and it startled me so badly I lost my balance, the board shooting out from under my feet as my hips smashed into the railing and I fell back to earth. I lay there for a moment, searing pain shooting through me before I felt a hand on my shoulder. Damn, that was a nasty fall, Aubrey exclaimed. You all right? After deciding I hadn't broken any bones, I answered, yeah, I think so. It stings like a bitch, though. I looked up at her. What the hell was that sound? I asked. She shook her head, a similar confused expression on her face. I don't know. Sounded like it came from back towards the main road. She looked around 
then back at me. I think it was a car crash. Yeah, my thoughts exactly, I muttered, pulling myself into a sitting position. Helping me to my feet, she motioned towards where the sound had come from. You wanna go see? She asked. After a moment's hesitation, I nodded. Tucking our boards back under our arms, we both hurried towards the road. Rounding the corner, we both immediately spied the devastation a few hundred feet ahead of us. Holy shit, Aubrey breathed out. The intersection of Chestnut and Main Street looked like the aftermath of a destruction derby. Two cars had collided almost head-on with each other, what looked like a late 80s or early 90s Buick Sabre and a brand new Cadillac Escalade. With a sense of numbness surging through me, I realized I had recognized both vehicles. The Cadillac belonged to Mr. Schultz, a rather wealthy but friendly man who rented out most of the houses he owned in town to the ski tourists that came to town every winter. The Buick belonged to Miss Kravitz, the old woman who I'd stood behind in the store yesterday. Smoke billowed out from both wrecks, and shattered glass and twists of metal littered the street around them for hundreds of feet. Oh my god, I said softly, echoing my friend's statement. We both exchanged a glance with each other and then began running towards the accident. As we ran, a small part of the back of my mind noticed something which was small but poignant. I didn't see anyone else running out of the buildings. Everyone in town had to have heard. Where are they? The train of thought was ripped away from me as we both skidded to a stop at the sight of the driver's doors of the Cadillac being kicked open. An ear-piercing sound burst out of the SUV's interior, and I dropped my board and clapped my hands over my ears. From the corner of my eye, I saw Aubrey do the same, squeezing her eyes shut in pain and stumbling back into the side of the brick building next to us. Even through my hands, I could still hear the sound though it was now slightly muffled. For a second, I couldn't place it. And then... Then it hit me. It was a loud, honking siren of the emergency alert system, but it sounded wrong. I, it was as if the tones had been warped and distorted into something else. And by the sound of it, Mr. Schultz had been listening to his car radio at full volume when they'd gone off. Speaking of which, a figure stumbled out from the SUV grabbing onto the open door for support. Holy hell in a handbasket. Mr. Schultz survived that, I thought. I swung my gaze over to the Buick, squinting through the spiderweb of cracks that had become the windshield. I saw a small hint of movement. I saw Miss Kravitz lean back into her seat. She must have gashed her head open pretty badly because her forehead was covered in blood. Keeping my hand over my ears to dull the still shrieking tone, I turned and got as close to Aubrey as I could so that she could hear me through her hands and over the noise. Gotta try to help them! I shouted as loud as I could. I could tell she understood me as she nodded after a second. And then she looked back towards the wreck. And a look flashed across her face. A look I can still remember perfectly. First confusion, and then, then a clear expression of renewed horror. I felt a shiver shoot up my spine and spun back around to look at what she'd seen. I truly wish I hadn't. Mr. Schultz was no longer next to his car. Instead, he'd ran around to the driver's side of the Buick. For a split second, I thought that it was to help her until the screaming began. I didn't realize that an elderly woman could scream so high and shrill. The busted windshield prevented me from seeing exactly what Mr. Schultz was doing to Mrs. Kravitz, but it didn't prevent me from seeing the sudden fountain of blood which spurted out and coated the inside of the glass like paint. The sight shocked me so much that I took my hands away from my ears to clamp them over my mouth to keep from screaming. It was then that I noticed that the tone had stopped screeching and Silence had again settled over the town, but only for a few seconds. The sounds that sprang up seemingly all over town, they... They were almost somehow worse than the tone. They were the sounds of screaming. Yells and shrieks came from every conceivable direction. What I could only assume was what the depths of hell itself sounded like. It was as if everyone in town were being brutally murdered at the same time. Almost as if it were a trigger, Mr. Schultz snapped his head up from where he'd been leaning into the car, and I saw his eyes gone completely red. It was as if all the capillaries in his eyes had burst. 
He reached back into the car and pulled something out with a sickening churn of my stomach. I saw it was a sharp shard of broken glass, one edge dripping still fresh blood from it. Without even looking in our direction, he took off back towards the heart of downtown in a sprint, almost in the manner of a child rushing to join the frolic in front of his friends at an amusement park. For a few moments, neither of us said anything, simply standing there in dumbstruck horror like, like deer in the headlights. Finally, Aubrey spoke up, her voice shaky. What the, what the absolute fuck just happened? She managed out. I could only shake my head, the cries of terror and what almost sounded like rage still coming from around the corner. She spoke again. He, he killed her. Mrs. Kravitz, he butchered her like a, like, a, like a cow in a slaughterhouse. Eddie, what the fuck? Her voice rose into a scream as she finished. We turned and clamped a hand over her mouth, afraid that her shriek would bring Mr. Schultz back to us. I put a finger to my lips, and after a few seconds, she nodded. Pulling my hand away, she spoke softer. Eddie, what the hell's happening? I shook my head, finally managing to find my voice. I... I... I don't know. She looked back towards the main road. We need to get back home. Now, I nodded. Agreed, but we can't blindly run out in the main road, not with... I gestured towards the hellish sounds coming from the directions we needed to go. Whatever the hell's going on? A look of realization crossed her face. The alleyways, she exclaimed, causing me to remember the maze of alleyways that crisscrossed between the main street's buildings. Okay, all right, but first, see exactly what the hell's going on. She hesitated, but nodded. Motioning to be quiet, I led the way to the corner of the building on one side of the intersection. Just let me look around the corner quick, I whispered. Again, she nodded silently. Taking a deep breath, I peered around the corner onto the main road. And if I hadn't already been in shock, I don't think I would have been able to keep from screaming at the grisly sight that awaited me. It was like a scene out of a horror movie. People were dashing around from building to building, clutching all sorts of things. Crutches, kitchen knives. There was even one man wielding what looked like an old sword which had hung inside the antique shop. That wasn't a horrifying sight. I mean, there were dozens of bodies littering Main Street. It seemed like people had dashed out of everywhere. The diner, grocery, hardware store, and more. Blood pooled around their still forms. Still others, some holding their arms or stomachs to stop the bleeding, were attempting to run away from those wielding weapons. They didn't make it very far, though, as, as they were overwhelmed by the others. They all shouted and screamed in what sounded like a total and complete rage as they chased them down. Fuck me, was all I could whisper out. I pulled my head back, and the look on my face must have told Aubrey all she needed to know. Her face had gone pale as a sheet. That bad? she asked. I nodded. I could see the cogs turning in her head. Okay, we stick to the plan. We use the alleys. We get through downtown and we get back to our houses. I felt a wave of gratitude pass over me. She was managing to hold her composure better than I could have hoped for. I nodded and followed her. We slipped into the gloomy shade of the alley that ran behind the buildings to the right side of the street. We made our way carefully through them, making sure not to attract any attention from the hell still erupting in the main drag. We saw little glimpses every time we reached a T-junction. We both saw people we'd known all of our lives. Inflicting violence upon each other so shocking and vile, I can't bring myself to write it down. I, I'd lose what little sanity remains in my head if I did. We made it back to the parking lot of the diner we'd initially met up in. And stopped to wait. The sound of gunshots blasting out caused us both to freeze and duck back into the alley to hide. And not a moment too soon either, because we saw the sheriff's Ford Explorer fly down the road. Sheriff Wake was leaning out the window, using one hand to steer while firing his pistol with the other. I only saw his face for a moment, but it was enough to see the same crazed look that the others had. The sound of the roaring engine faded along with the gunshots after a few seconds. We could still hear the screeching tires echoing over all the chaos. 
Aubrey turned to look at me, an almost hopeless look on her face. Eddie, what the hell do we do? She said weakly. I knelt and I thought hard and fast. We, we can't stay outside much longer. We, we stay out here, we're dead. We need to find shelter, at least for a little while. I spoke. We need to find a place to lie low for a little while, and until we know that we can make it safely back to the other side of town. Her face turned into a mask of panic. What about our parents? I felt a knot tie itself in my stomach, and I thought of my mom and dad caught up in this hell without a way to get a hold of me, threatening to overwhelm me. But I, I kept as level ahead as I could. We're not going to be able to help them if we both end up like the others, I said as calmly as possible. There's too many people all over the place to avoid all the way back. We need to find some place not many people would have been at. We need to hunker down until we think it's safe enough to keep going. She looked like she wanted to argue, but nodded after a few moments. Then looked at me. The library, she said simply. Not many people besides the adults go there anymore. It's right on the other side of this building, she said, pointing at the brick apartments that made up the far side of the alley. I nodded. Okay. Let's wait a second, and then we go. She nodded. And after not seeing anyone for a minute, we began moving from car to car in the parking lot, using them as cover to reach the street. It looked towards the diner. The inside of the windows I could see were splashed in blood. Evidence of the slaughter that must have taken place inside. I also noticed with a vague air of surprise that the ground in the diner's parking lot seemed to be littered with smartphones. Screens from many were still lit up, and as I stepped over one, I glanced down to see the notice flashing up on the screen. Test alert. This is a test of the National Wireless Emergency Alert System. No action is needed. As I read it, a sound snapped in my head. It was the sound of static from a radio coming from a few cars up. Sharing a look of panic with Aubrey and convinced the sound would draw unwanted attention our way, we hurried down the line towards the sound. It was coming from a red wrangler. One which I recognized belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Nolt. Two survivalists who lived further up the mountains, but came down into town to buy supplies and sometimes eat at the diner. Scrambling to the passenger door, I yanked the handle, praying for it to be unlocked. The door mercifully opened, and with a last look around, I practically flew into the passenger seat. The crackling sound was coming from the old CB radio, mounted under the dash. I reached to shut it off. That was when the crackling static changed to the smooth sound of a man's voice. Sir, all entrance and exits to the town have been coroned off. Sentries placed to make sure no one enters or leaves. A satellite feed should be up in about 30 minutes. Jammers will be up in 10. Another man's voice answered him, this one deep and authoritative. Very good, Deacons. All of Ultra Phase 1's now go. Maintain radio silence for the next 12 hours. The first voice spoke again. Roger that, sir. Over and out. And with that, the radio died, now not even belting out static. I shot a look out the open window at Aubrey, who gave me a similar look of shock and confusion. Was that happening intentionally? Did someone cause this? I didn't stop to wonder beyond that, though. Climbing back out of the jeep, I softly closed the door and motioned for her to keep moving, making sure that nobody was near us. We stayed hunched over and made a mad dash for the library. That's where we've been ever since. We got inside and barricaded the front door with some benches, which were inside the foyer. Aside from, to our horror, the body of Mrs. Thatch, the librarian, it was thankfully empty. I went and I found an old drop cloth in the closet and draped it over. I couldn't stand to see what someone had done to the back of her skull with what looked like a pipe or a wrench. The sounds of our fellow townsfolk slaughtering each other barely let up for the last few hours. But as the sun began to set, it slowly turned silent. I don't know whether that's because the carnage had stopped for now or everyone who's gone insane is dead. I don't dare think about that, though. The, the idea that my parents, as well as Aubrey's, along with all of our friends, are either lying in a pool of blood somewhere or slinking through the shadows, looking for us. It's, it's a bit too much to bear. 
We still hear the roar of the sheriff's cruiser roaming around downtown, though. After some thought, and with the night coming fast, we decided to stay here for the night. In the morning, if it's safe, we'll take down the barricade and we'll try to make it back to the residential side of town. But in the meantime, I, I tried both the landline telephone and the computer connection to the internet. Neither of them's working. The only thing that did, which I'm using to type out now, is a laptop that seems to have satellite connection. So whoever these people are, they must not have thought that anyone in town has a satellite link up. Still spotty. As I said at the start, though, no social sites, no Facebook, Twitter, neither does YouTube. Email doesn't work, but for whatever reason, Reddit seems to. So in the darkness of the library's break room, I type this out and I pray to God that it's successfully posted and that somebody will see it. And if you do, please tell me what Aubrey and I should do. Anything that might help us survive. I'll, I'll check it in the morning before we head out. If you have any idea what those men on the radio were talking about, about whatever RF Ultra is, please tell me because I can't understand what's happening or why. And if, if they haven't blocked access entirely, I'll try and make another post tomorrow. Okay, to, to let you know that we're still alive, but for now... For now, I need to try and get some sleep, if that's even possible. And if I don't post... If I don't post, you'll know we didn't make it. So, my father used to own a cabin. Um... In fact, he used to own a lot of different properties, which I suppose is just a roundabout way of saying that we grew up with money, <laughs> where things where things get a little bit complicated, is how he actually made that money. The line that he constantly fed us was that he was an accountant running his own firm in an office in the city. You know, long hours, lots of business trips. We never saw him much, and, and whenever we did, he always seemed tired. His eyes perpetually bloodshot, as if he were always trying to force them to stay open. He was sent off to prison right after I'd finished my first year of college. The sentence was 15 years for washing hundreds of millions of dollars of numerous cartels. Two weeks after he'd been booked, my mother committed suicide, and as it turns out, She'd been helping him out through the entire thing and was facing some time herself. I guess she didn't want to deal with all that. She just took the drastic way out. A few months later, the government had seized pretty much all of his property, all of it except for that cabin in the woods. <laughs> it, it took a long time for me to feel normal again, but eventually, you know, I, I managed it. I went back to school, graduated with a good enough GPA, which allowed me to snag some shitty office job a few months later, but it was enough to pay the bills. Now fast forward about another year, and I've basically scrubbed the entire sequence of events out of my brain. <laughs> Took a little bit of therapy, a lot of psychedelics, but I finally did it. It was a point where I was comfortable enough to go back to that cabin. The one place where I'd see my father for more than a few weeks at a time during our summer trips. I decided to take along three of my friends from uni, Jack, Pedro, and Randy. We, uh, we drove down there at the beginning of May. The road leading to the cabin hadn't been maintained at all. And as a result, it had become borderline undrivable. I decided to save my vehicle the stress, and I parked in a nearby lot, leaving us about a one and a half mile trek through the woods, which really wasn't so bad. Our time in the cabin was pretty much spent getting drunk and stoned. And by the third night, we had completely run out of food. So we decided to take the 30 minute walk over to the nearest rest stop where I knew there was a 24 hour diner. So we go there, we eat our meals, and on the way back, we notice a burning smell in the woods as if there was a bonfire raging about nearby. Of course, it was a bit strange, given that it was around 2 a.m., but we didn't think too much of it at the time. We just kept right on walking. 
It was only when the smell continued to grow stronger as we got closer to the cabin that we understood something was very wrong. Soon it had become suffocating. We could see the night sky tinged with orange in the near distance. I felt my heart drop into my stomach and immediately I was sprinting. My worst fear realized as I reached the clearing where the cabin was located. Completely up in flames, plumes of dark smoke blending in with the night. It was a mix of different emotions that hit me all at once, the combination of them creating a sense of dread so deep I hadn't thought it possible. After reeling myself in, I called 911, with the operator telling me that the fire department would be on their way but wouldn't be able to reach us for at least another 30 minutes. The four of us walked away from the cabin in silence, getting far enough so that the smoke was no longer scratching at our throats. Around 10 minutes later, we noticed that the orange tinge in the sky had suddenly disappeared, and I mean... Suddenly, like gone in the blink of an eye. I thought I might have been hallucinating, but it was clear from their expressions that my friends were seeing something similar. But cautiously, we started making our way towards the cabin, noticing that the smoke was no longer heavy in the air. It cleared up considerably. Once we reached the clearing, it had disappeared altogether. I looked ahead, my brain working overtime to comprehend the sight before me. The cabin was no longer on fire. I burnt to a crisp, sure, but the raging, overwhelming flames that had been consuming it just minutes prior had somehow completely fizzled out. The four of us looked between each other, as if to confirm we were all still seeing the same thing. Now, using a flashlight on my phone to survey the damage, I found pretty much what I'd expected. Complete destruction. Absolutely zero hope of recovering anything. I started taking some deep breaths, you know, trying to calm myself down, and I heard Pedro yell out from the other side. Guys, where the fuck did this thing come from? And we all walked over to him. And nestled in the debris was the corpse of... something. A monstrosity. It was about the size of a bear with the sections of its body that weren't burnt showing pale, clammy skin with deep cuts etched throughout it. It would look to be some kind of crude pattern. Its head had been smashed in, leaving nothing but an abnormally wide bottom jaw, which was still bearing long black teeth. It had an uncountable number of long, thick arms that it was using to hold something that resembled a human infant. One that it appeared to be completely unscathed, devoid of any burn marks. The longer I stared at it, the more that I was convinced I could see it breathing. It was a bizarre enough sight to put us into a near trance. What eventually snapped us out of it was, was the chanting. I mean, it was barely noticeable at first, slowly escalating in pitch until it was clear that there were several human voices shouting in unison. Their tones were animalistic, their words strung together with just the bare beginnings of a rhythm. It sounded like they were speaking English, though I could hardly make out anything they were saying. The strangest part, though, is how quickly it was getting closer to us. Definitely not a walking pace, it was more like a sprint. The four of us shared a quick glance between each other, and immediately there was an understanding. We ran, we ran like bats out of hell, tripping over branches, our own feet. But eventually we reached my car, all of us scrambling to pile into it. As I was fumbling for my keys, the chanting had become deafening, to, to a point that it, it hardly made sense. It sounded as if there were speakers lined up in a circle around us, all blasting that horrible noise. And the second that I put the keys into the ignition, things went silent. I found myself holding my breath as I looked up, my eyes slowly adjusting to the darkness until what I was seeing was unmistakable. Several figures standing completely still at the edge of the woods. All human-shaped, but far too large to be people. 
All the air in my lungs flooded out. With one big exhale, and I slammed the vehicle into drive and took a sharp turn before speeding the hell out of there, refusing to look in the rear view until we had made it into the highway. I drove until I had reached the rest stop, which was now hosting an absurd number of police cars. And I parked, I got out, and I approached one of the cops, asking if they were here because of the fire. The cop shook his head. Fire? No, uh, has there been a fire? I explained the situation to him with the cabin, deciding to leave out the creature and the, the chanting for the time being. The cop nodded slowly, his expression remaining largely the same throughout. All right, he said. I'll look into it. I'll give you an update in the morning. For tonight, you just get a hotel or something. We exchanged numbers, and I thanked him. As I began to walk away, he called out to me. Hey, hey, can I ask you something? I turned around. Yeah, I said, sure. Do you happen to be... My dad's name's son. For a while, I just stared at him. And eventually, I nodded. Yeah, he said. I thought I recognized you. I, I don't understand, I told him. I, I've never seen you before. The cop took a deep breath before taking a quick look around. Come here. He said, come close. Tentatively, I did so. I can't tell you everything. I don't even know everything, but I think you should have the right to know the truth about your father. All the stuff that's happened here tonight, all this shit that you've seen, has something to do with him. He took another look around before continuing. Cartels, right? Is that the story they told you? It's not so creative, but I guess it doesn't have to be creative to be believable, because the shit that he was actually mixed up in, you wouldn't believe unless you'd seen it for yourself. The hell are you talking about? I asked. Look, I have your number. I'll be in touch tomorrow morning. This is something I'm curious about as well, so maybe maybe you can give me some answers, point me in the right directions, but not here. So, get out of here before people start noticing you. Stay safe. I didn't feel like staying in a hotel that night, so I just I drove back into the city, dropped everybody off before arriving back at my own apartment. And of course, I couldn't sleep that night. My eyes wired open into the morning as I as I waited for the officer to call. He still hadn't by the time noon rolled around, and so I I tried calling him instead. No answer. Eventually, I did receive a call from the police telling me that my father's cabin had burned down and that it was due to a forest fire. I told him that wasn't possible. There, there'd been no forest fire, that I suspected foul play, and I wanted that to be investigated. It's already been investigated, are the exact words the officers told me. Don't worry about it. Just get in touch with insurance. Go over your options. And before I could say anything else, he hung up on me. It was a mixture of anger and curiosity that compelled me to drive back down there. I don't know what I expected, but it certainly wasn't for the road leading towards the rest stop to be blocked altogether. There were two cop cars guarding the barrier, with a single officer signaling any vehicles approaching to turn around. I pulled over to the side of the road, and after some careful deliberation, I decided to get out and approach him and ask him what's going on, just to see what he might say. When I finished the question, he stared at me for a long time, uncomfortably long. Emergency construction is what he eventually told me. After the encounter, I pretty much dropped trying to figure things out. Some weird things started happening to me since. Every night, I swear, I hear a, I hear a baby crying in the apartment across from me. The apartment that I thought had been occupied by a pair of college kids who definitely do not have children. That cop that was supposed to call me finally did a few nights ago, and when I answered, I was met with dead silence on the other end. Nearly 30 seconds of it till the line clicked dead. There's an abandoned house sitting across the street from my apartment building. One that's supposedly been there for years because the development of the store that was meant to take its place keeps getting delayed. Well, somebody's been staring at me through the second floor window. Whenever I catch them doing it, they quickly close the blinds. I can never catch any details, but I know, I know the moment I turn away from it, their eyes are back on me. I, 
I can't confirm any of these things are related. Whether it has anything to do with my father, I just... I just know that I don't want to deal with it. And I want it to end. April 2nd. April 2nd changed my life forever. Rita Mae was born at approximately 6.07 in the morning, and my wife and I brought her home the very next day. No one ever tells you how much a baby changes your life. It's, it's one of those experiences that's hard to really put down in words. I'm here to tell you it straight, all right? Um, there won't be any sugarcoating here. Being a parent is a full-time job, and a lot of times it feels like you want to pull your hair out. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, we immediately fell in love with Rita. For the first two weeks, as a matter of fact, you could say that she was a perfect little angel. I mean, in fact, I'd never even seen a baby act so good. My wife, Stephanie, was overjoyed with being able to breastfeed, getting Rita into a sleeping routine, even having a little time for herself since Rita was accommodating to her bassinet so well right off the bat. Those early days would make any parent immediately think about having another kid, even if they were all so amazing and all so well behaved like our newborn was. But something changed at the two-week mark. I, I wish I could say for sure it was. I had to work that day and Steph took our little girl to the doctor for her first round of vaccinations. I mean, a routine appointment that every child has to endure. We knew to expect some fussiness after the shots were given. The doctor also advised us to make sure that she was fed regularly and not dehydrated. According to them, sleepiness was a side effect of the medicine, so after the screaming died down, Rita would get drowsy and we would go back to the same old routine as before. But, um... Well, the problem is that... that never happened. On my lunch break, I called staff to see how our little princess was doing, only to hear a loud shriek that made my eardrums want to burn. I'll, I'll, I'll call you later, I shouted as I hung up and frowned, wondering how long our newborn had been upset. I assumed it was just a simple crying spell. It would be over by the time I got home. Instead, that afternoon, as I walked in, I heard Rita squealing, and Steph was pacing the kitchen, trying to burp her. Hey, there's my little angel. How's daddy's girl? I cooed. Steph shot me a dirty look and offered the squealing infant to me. I don't know what's wrong with her. I've tried everything. Bottles, blankets, bath, you name it. I tried it, she admitted as she tried to hold back tears. I think she's clearly distressed. I mean, earlier when I tried to breastfeed, she bit me so hard that it drew blood. Rita continued to squeal as I rocked her. It looked at our baby girl in concern. Think we should go to the emergency room? Did you call the doctor? I asked. Steph nodded as she paced the refrigerator. Pediatrician has got a free opening on Thursday, but... That's days away. Maybe we should go to the ER? It's been hours now, and it's non-stop. I think that lab tech did something. I, I don't know. I didn't know what to do either. We don't live close to a hospital. I knew the drive would be taxing, especially because I was supposed to go to work the next day. No one gives you an instruction manual for this sort of stuff. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and go. I mean, it's better to be safe than sorry, I told my wife. We loaded up the car and put our newborn in the rear-facing car seat, all while she continued to cry and scream, anxiety levels spiking as we drove down the road. Steph sat back there with her, trying to comfort her, but I soon saw firsthand nothing seemed to be working. My mind began to race as I wondered what could possibly be the matter. What if Steph was right and the tech had punctured a nerve, or was our daughter going to be all right? As soon as we got to the emergency room, I fully expected that Rita's wails would get us seen immediately, but reality set in when we were given paperwork to fill out and paced the waiting room alongside everyone else. We sat down and I tried my best to focus on the questionnaire, but the more Rita cried and screamed, the more irritable I became. Not with her, but, but with the hospital staff. I mean, they seemed to take no interest in her suffering, letting other clearly less urgent cases into the triage. Maybe we should try to go somewhere else. I mean, there's a Small neighborhood urgent care down the road, I told Steph. But they only accept cash. We don't have that kind of money. I worried that we were bound to be at the hospital all night, 
So I got up and called my boss, told him I wouldn't be coming in the next morning. I mean, he wasn't happy about that, but he claimed that he understood. Family comes first. All while I was doing this, I kept hearing Rita and wondering if she was even catching her breath. I mean, it was insane, I thought, as I walked back and looked at Steph apologetically. The ER was at a standstill. No one could tell me for sure when we would even be seen. It was pissing me off. My little girl was in excruciating pain, and these assholes didn't seem to care. I marched up to the glass, banging to get their attention. John, this isn't going to help, Steph told me angrily, but I wasn't listening. We had been waiting for hours and still hadn't even gotten to a bed. We should have been sent straight up to labor and delivery. What, what's the holdup? I demanded. Sir, you need to take a seat. I understand your concerns, but right now, labor and delivery can't accommodate anyone. There's nothing we can do, the nurse said, but... But it was in a harsh tone. Something about the tone set me off, and I started to raise my voice. Don't be condescending with me. Our baby is in pain, and you're just telling me to, to shrug it off? She got on her radio and muffled something, which only made me more upset. Hold on, did you just call security on me? Because I'm mad that you haven't lifted a finger to help my baby? A moment later, an officer twice my size entered the room. Steph grabbed my shoulder, giving me a look. Maybe we should just go, she said. I looked over to Rita, who was continuing to squeal and looked like she couldn't even breathe properly. My heart breaking as I realized the hospital was close to throwing us out. If you don't take a seat and cooperate, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to leave, the guard warned. But I had had enough. I grabbed our stuff and I marched out. Part of me felt foolish. We were no closer to figuring out why Rita was upset, but I was tired of feeling that my time was wasted. On the drive home, Steph gave me the stink eye, but agreed that we had chosen to go at the wrong time. There's an urgent care pediatrics, but it won't be open until the morning, she said, checking her phone. It was better than nothing, as much as I hated the prospect of letting our baby scream all night. I wasn't sure what choice we had. When we got home, we took shifts taking care of her, trying to make sure she ate or had a diaper change. Rita never stopped wailing. I was sure she was in excruciating distress, and we were doing nothing to make it better. Our own stress was through the roof. I, I told my wife to get a bit of sleep, if she could, and I took Rita to the guest room. The walls were thicker in there, so I guess if one of us brought her in here to cry, the other could get some much-needed shut-eye. Steph admitted sleep was going to be difficult. Even without hearing her infant, her motherly instincts took over, and she was checking up on us almost every half hour. I'm handling her so you can get some sleep, I told her, as I tried again to rock Rita. Her face was bright red by now, and I couldn't even imagine how she had managed to scream all day. My mind told me that this had to be impossible. I mean, if she, if she was that deprived of oxygen, she would have passed out. There would have been moments where she caught her breath, but I simply wasn't noticing it. It couldn't possibly be this bad. I didn't want to imagine it permanently harming her, but with each passing moment at home, that dreaded thought lingered in my mind, especially as I looked at her and saw her veins popping near her neck and forehead. I mean, what if this caused permanent brain damage or worse? Deep breath, I thought frantically, and yet here I was sitting in the dark, unable to do a single thing to help her. As I rocked her, her piercing squeals heightened my anxiety with each passing second. My fear was compounded by searching for similar cases online. Many of the things people claimed happened to their newborn were terrifying. Nightmare-inducing images of babies with bleeding mouths and ears filled my screen. It was enough to make my stomach turn end over end. I mean, this couldn't possibly be happening to my Rita. When Steph took over to let me rest, my head was filled with frightening thoughts of what could be happening. Yet somehow, we made it through the night. I think sheer exhaustion finally took us past our breaking point. In the morning, Rita was still in pain, her throat dry from her screams, her little body wailing. Steph was trying her best to keep it together as we hurried and got in the car again. We were holding out hope that the pediatric urgent care would have the answers we needed. But it wound up a dead end. They did a cursory check of Rita, including her lungs and, and checking her for infections, but after running tests, they surprised us and said there was nothing noticeably wrong with her. No fever, no broken bones, no signs of trauma. If you ask me, this is just a short phase that your baby's going through. She took fluids like normal, so there's really no need to worry. You'll simply have to endure it. 
My wife looked like she was about to snap. They simply didn't believe us, she said, when we left. No baby could scream that long or be unable to sleep. And so because our story was so unfathomable, they sent us on our merry way, thinking we were just a pair of typical, overly concerned parents. I was at a loss. We had gone to the doctors and finally gotten tests done, but nothing, nothing explained what was happening to her. Think of this as waiting for a butterfly to emerge from a cocoon. The transformation itself can be a little ugly, the nurse said as we walked out of the urgent care office. I didn't even bother saying thank you. I mean, in my mind, they had done absolutely nothing to help us. I don't think I can handle much more of this, Steph lamented as we got home and tried to settle Rita again with every trick in the book. Her screams only seemed to get worse. She kept clawing and scratching, hitting and wailing. It was clear she was desperate for our help. I knew that I wasn't as competent as a doctor, so I wasn't about to, to challenge their diagnosis, but instead I did the only thing I could think of, and I, I told my job I'd try to come in the next day. I mean, I, I had to get my mind off this. Steph wasn't too happy when I gave her that news. You're just going to leave me here alone so you can get away from her? She snapped. I wasn't in the mood to argue. Rita was driving us up the wall with her painful cries, and we were turning on each other. I apologized and I left not long after that, promising I would check in to see if Rita had finally settled. We have to trust the doctors know what they're talking about. And if something's wrong, they would know, I told her. He didn't even do an internal scan. I mean, what if something's inside her and hurting her? Steph said desperately. They did all the tests they felt were necessary, I told her. But I had my doubts too. I mean, something was wrong with our daughter, that much was clear. The only thing I could think of was the recent checkup. So when I went to work and had a bit of free time, I called the clinic to find out precisely what they had given to Rita that day. Oh, little Rita May, how is she? The nurse asked cheerfully over the phone. I didn't bother trying to convince them of any issues and repeated my inquiry. Just typical shots we give to every newborn at that stage. I, I must say I meant to call and ask how your wife was handling it. She couldn't even bear to watch when we administered the needle. I picked up on the choice words and asked the nurse to explain. Oh, what I mean to say is that she stepped out of the room when we gave the vaccine. I mean, it's actually pretty common, I guess. No one wants to see their baby in that sort of pain. I thanked the nurse, trying not to panic as my mind wondered why this felt significant. Stephanie had left the room. I mean, what if they'd done something to Rita that wasn't on record? Another dark thought crossed my mind as I drove home. What if one of the nurses had discreetly swapped out Rita with another newborn in the clinic? I mean, it was the type of scenario that no parent wanted to ever fathom, but it, it could fit all the behavioral issues we've seen. And had, had we foolishly been doting on a baby we didn't know? An infant that was screaming frantically to be return to their own family? Was our Rita out there somewhere right now trying desperately to let whoever had taken her know about this terrible mistake? As I pulled into the driveway, I couldn't help but to take a long breath. I was letting my imagination run wild. There was no reason to suspect something so nightmarish had happened. I just need to be here and support my wife and we'll get through this, I told myself as I walked inside the house. To my surprise, as I unlocked the door, I soon was greeted with silence. The small duplex we rented was dark, and I sighed in relief. Surely this was a good sign. Rita had finally settled down. I dropped my keys and I walked to the nursery, flipping on the lights, eager to see our sleeping little princess. Instead, instead I was greeted with the manifestation of all my fears combined. A blood-soaked mattress. I stood there staring at it in disbelief and then towards the floor where I saw what looked like a tiny trail of mucus and blood zigzagging towards the door. The small crib she'd been lying in was all torn apart as if by sheer force. I turned and called out to my wife, but there was no response. My heart pounded as I followed the trail of blood and guts into our bedroom. The soft gleam of my phone light revealing more gory viscera on display in our king-sized bed. My heart sank as I turned on the light and saw... Stephanie. 
lying there. In her own blood. Her legs open and covered in scratches and teeth marks. As I saw what had happened. Our newborn, or rather whatever had replaced her, had forcibly pushed its way inside of my wife's body again. The sheer amount of tissue and blood that covered the bed told me that Steph had done her best to fight off this monster, but the results... The results had been a losing battle. Now she was decomposing, staring wide-eyed and soulless up at the sky as the creature wriggled under her belly. Torn in every direction, I saw the creature pulsing with a heartbeat inside of my dead wife's womb. I screamed and backed away from the horrific scene, calling 911 as I bailed out of the door and struggled to catch my breath. I was hardly making sense to the operator, but I gave them my address and they said that they'd be there in 30 minutes. Somewhere in the span of time, the miniature demon that had crawled its way into our lives and fooled us into believing it was my sweet Rita May had vanished into the night. When the text got there, all they found was what little was left of my wife. It's like something shoved its way inside her body, ate her from the inside out, one of the technicians said in disbelief. He was a small comfort, but they told me there were signs of a struggle. Steph... Steph had tried to fight back. The creature must have been waiting until we were so exhausted that we couldn't put up a fight. I realized sourly as I, I thanked them for coming. They told me the police want to question me. Typical procedure. One thing swirls around in my mind as I try to make sense of what little sanity I have left. Where's my daughter? What happened to her? I fear I may never know and I'd be labeled monster myself. Who would believe this shocking story? In the distant air amidst the shadows I hear a newborn baby wail. Is that my Rita? Or is the creature beckoning me to my own demise? I've sat here on the porch for an hour waiting for the police and I heard the infant in the woods calling out to me. I, I don't know what I'll find out there, but feel compelled to find it. Have a seat, they offered. That unyielding, uncaring beast of torture who beckons sweetly to seat you at the mouth of hell. You've been here before. How could you have forgotten? Your mind remembers the last torturous exchange at the hands of the eye. Has it been that long already? seems like only yesterday that you sat before this device and were made quivering supplicant before its undeniable power. You beg with them, you plead with them, you offer them excuses that each ring more hollow than the one before, but they smile their implacable smile and tell you it's a part of it and you must have a seat. Then you're down at eye level with a device of unimaginable horror. You stare unblinkingly into the eye of some dark elder god that loves you not. The device, the torture. The torturous abomination of man stares back at you with its soulless eye, full of nothing but the dark knowledge of your pain. And as you sit staring into it, you find yourself. You find your hatred of it lost amidst the dark miasma of nothingness within it. Its implacable gaze fixed upon you. And then, the waiting begins. The waiting. The waiting is the worst. As the cruel operator of pain takes their place, you stare into the eye and wonder when the blow will come. The eye of this great terror hangs before you, staring. And you know in your heart that it is just as unmovable as the one who wakes it. 
They think they understand it. Understand the power it represents, but could either of you truly understand this thing? If God appears before us, if the sky split open and some towering eye looked down through the tear, could any of us really understand it? Our thoughts and prayers and feelings and terrors are all insignificant as the white noise before the eye of this nightmare creature that sits a mere nose length from your precious eye. Oh God, it's moving. As it moves and slides and takes its position, you suddenly wish for the waiting again. The waiting was worse, but the waiting was safe. And now this monstrosity is alive. It takes its time. As it goes into position, its movements more graceful than any hunting cat. It stalks your tender orb. What does it want? Why doesn't it just get it over with? You're powerless before it. Even if you could rise, you wouldn't. As it takes its time and finds the most delicate part of your treasured eye, you wait and hunch and hope you're ready for the... It strikes! A single dry puff into your already exposed eye and you jump and you writhe with fright and Im imagined pain and then you laugh. <laughs> of course, you laugh because it's such an insignificant puff of air. You hardly notice the other eye as a similar breath of the beast fell air assault and this Mistress of pain and anguish declares you done. She invites you to rise and move away from a machine that could never hurt you, could never threaten you. You forget your fear and you forget your terror, but how well we remember it when it comes time to stand before the eye again. I'm sure everyone can remember their retail days. You know, the period of our lives when we work long hours for shit pay and at the mercy of every dickhead who felt a soy sauce shortage was a legitimate reason to ruin someone else's shift. I'm still, unfortunately, eyeballs deep in that phase of my life, and I sure wish that soccer moms with bad haircuts or thumb-shaped juice heads with little man syndrome were the biggest of my problems. We all make jokes about working retail being hell, you know, and some, some even compare it to purgatory. Between space where time passes and a painstaking crawl, it's nothing compared to this. I had my back pressed against a cold refrigerator in the appliance showroom. I was waiting to get the hang of this disturbing version of hide and seek, but I was getting pretty tired of being the one hiding all the time. You could hear the subtle, deep-throated clicking of the creature as it made its slow pursuit up the aisles, meticulously searching. Um, it knew I was here. They always did. Next to the arch of its back over high shelves, its gangly limbs clinging to beams to keep its balance. I held my hands over my mouth and tried to steady my breath as the creature made its clumsy advances. A viscous sludge oozed from its skin, sounding like tar when it dripped to the floor. The sludge eating away at everything it touched like corrosive piranha solution. It smelled of hot floor in a dumpster, like burnt tire rubber, warm beer and melted plastic, with the nose-curling sourness of spoiled food. I could feel the muscles in my gut seizing, threatening to eject the dry cereal I shoveled into my mouth this morning. The refrigerator rattled as I saw a meaty clawed hand the size of a large dog cling to the tops, followed by the sound of ragged breath. The smell grew heavier as the hand slapped from one fridge to another until it settled the top of mine. It sat there just long enough to wonder if I'd been found before it, along with the smell, vanished entirely. Oh, thank God. I waited for my heart to move from hammering in my throat to back into my chest. I peeked my head from behind the fridge to see no one. I was alone again. Management nearly got you this time, man. Or at least I thought I was. 
I about pissed myself and quickly turned around to find a mannequin standing within shoe-throwing distance in an ugly sweater and a pair of fitted khakis. Fred, Jesus Christ, I, I told you to start announcing yourself. I mean, I could have, but then you would have ended up at Shirley's lunch. I know what everyone would be thinking about now. Now this guy is hiding from monsters and talking to mannequins. He's probably nuts. And yeah, yeah, you'd probably be right. But consider this first. I work retail. I deserve to be crazy. So reserve all judgments for now. The mannequin, Fred, swung his body from side to side, stiffly waddling over to me. So what'd you do to make her mad this time? Breathe too loud, sit too long. I stood up and dusted the lint bunnies from my pants. Fidgeting with a sign sticky tab, I said. Yeah, that'll do it. She got one earlier. Poor bastard, didn't even see her coming. Fred looked like a life-size Ken doll and spoke with a New York accent. His mouth never moved, though. It was permanently fixed into a smile. One filled with a row of perfectly straight, white-painted teeth. But his eyes? Those moved. They seemed to follow you. It was like one of those spooky old paintings where the eyes seemed to track you around the room, no matter where you went. It was a little creepy. Donkey tattoo, Juan? I liked him. He didn't give me as many stink eyes as the others. Yeah, well, he's got no eyes to stink with anymore. Squashed like a watermelon. Kasplat! Cheryl didn't even stop to look at him. Yeesh. Better him than us. Us. It won't eat you. It'd be like eating a plastic bead, I said as I began to reface the water filter again. I, I mean, yeah, but I'd give her indigestion for you if she ever does. Fred made an attempt at putting his hands on his hips with an awkward, rubbery squeak. How noble of you. If Fred had been endowed with the gift of face muscles, he'd probably be wearing a shit-eating grin. Hey, it ain't easy being a hero. I listened again to see if Cheryl was still around. You'll never be too careful with manager five ears to the ground, Cheryl. The screams in the distance told me it was somewhere in household chemicals, which meant there were around six miles of store between us. The hellscape where I work is called Theta Mart. It was supposed to be like a super shopping center, best described as if a mall in Costco had a baby. But this baby was unfortunately disfigured so horribly it broke and disregarded the laws of the reality we live in. All that to say, Theta Mart is like a retail affair baby if H.P. Lovecraft was the mistress. It's full of impossible creatures, monsters, and products an insane person couldn't even conjure in their strangest fever dreams. Everything inside a Theta Mart is white, a stark sterile white from floor to ceiling. With shelves that stand several tall men high, there's the lingering smell of cheap plastic in here, and the only thing piercing the constant mind-numbing silence is the distant sound of tinny elevator music that seemingly comes from everywhere and from nowhere. The tune feels so familiar, you know, just not enough to place or follow. If that wasn't chilling enough, the screams that abruptly break the silent hours when management is close by is frightening enough to start the heart of a dead man. Which is why it was so strange when first a momentary blanket of silence fell over the store, like what they do for memorials. It was an oppressive, drawn-out stillness before being broken by a voice erupting from the invisible speakers. Max, there's a call waiting for you on... The page was followed by a shrill garble that sounded like Jabba the Hutt was being choked on rocks before it went silent again. I looked at Fred. What the fuck was that? You got a page, man. You gotta answer it. How? There's no phone in this department. The nearest working phone that I knew of was in electronics, which was about six or so miles away. I just cut my losses and throw myself from the highest shelf. There was no way I'd make it without being maimed or eaten before getting there. As absurd as this place is, I don't think trekking over toys and finding a play school Elmo and friend's smartphone would cut it either. Well, I won't stop paging you to you answer it. Trust me, you're going to want to answer it. What? What happens if I don't? He doesn't respond and instead stares silently for a moment. Hello? He lunged forward and snatched my phone. Hey! I swiped to get it back, but Fred was quick for a guy with limited mobility. Sorry, pal, you'll thank me later. 
He began to speed waddle away. I actually had to run after him just to keep up, which was impressive considering his legs only moved in two directions. Fred? Fred, I can't... I can't leave without my... He disappeared, heading deeper into the store. Ah, uh, man. Considering the short time I've been here, I've learned a lot about this place and how it operates. Sort of. In the grand scheme of it all, I probably know absolutely dip squat, but, but because of these dubious guidelines, I've made it far enough to share this. Stay away from the other associates. They may look like people or potential survival partners, perhaps the last anchor you could hold steadfast to sanity with, but they are absolutely definitely not. Far from it. Avoid them at all costs. They may have been human once, but they certainly aren't anymore. Considering the short time I've been here, I've learned a lot about this place and how it operates, sort of. In the grand scheme of it all, I know absolutely dip squat, but because of these dubious guidelines, I made it far enough to share this. Stay away from the other associates. They may look like people or potential survival partners, or perhaps the last anchor you could hold steadfast to sanity with. But they are absolutely, definitely not. Far from it. Avoid them at all costs. They might have been human once, but they certainly aren't anymore. The areas that turn yellow, or the zones of the store that are more decrepit than the other areas, and are more prone to management activity. That's what Cheryl is. The denizens of this place are known as management. The higher the status, the nastier they are. Be sure to follow the first two rules, no matter what. The areas that turn yellow, or the zones of the store that are more decrepit than the other areas, are more prone to management activity. That's what Cheryl is. The denizens of this place are known as management. The higher the status, the nastier they are. Be sure to follow the first two rules, no matter what, and it'll make life a lot easier. Funnily enough, Fred actually bestowed upon me a lot of the knowledge I've accumulated about this place, which pisses me off even more when I had to actively choose to break all three rules. Fred, this isn't funny! I don't have time for your crap! I continued walking at a brisk pace, following the distant taps of hollow dress shoes. All around me, the fluorescent lights became yellower, more tarnished. They flicker and hum overhead, and some blown out completely. There are pillows and overturned furniture, soggy boxes, and broken glass strewn about the linoleum. The smell of stale old couch, stuffing and mildew penetrated the air and hung like a wet blanket, making it slightly uncomfortable to breathe. I walked beneath the hanging sign saying in bold blue letters, Home and Decor. Crap. I found myself reconsidering how important my phone really was. I mean, I could just buy a new one, sure. The, the other one isn't even paid off yet. But is it really worth being eaten or squashed or whatever it is monsters do to people? A scrawny college student sustained purely off of rum and an espresso can't taste that good, right? Just when I talked myself into abandoning my phone with every puppy pick of my dog I'd ever taken, I felt eyes fixed on me. I'd been spotted. Maxwell. Shit. I slowly turned around to find looming over me was Nosferatu. Well, he's not actually Nosferatu, but he could have had me fooled if it was a spirit Halloween. Ralph, you look, uh, alive today? Ralph's skin clung to his skeletal frame like wet toilet paper. The white of his eyes were as sunken and yellow as the lights around us, and his apron identical to mine, covered in various stains of several concerning colors. I tried my best not to stare at them as he leaned down and hovered closer to my face. His irises glistened, a gloss milky white with something swirling behind their film. Why aren't you in your department, Maxwell? Now would have been an amazing time to be great at lying, but I wasn't much of a talker at the best of times. I, uh, it, uh, I, I was getting, my eyes began frantically darting around for a sign or, milk, milk, 
yeah, milk. Can't have my bones break it on the job, right? I made an attempt at a playful punch, but Ralph was so much squishier than he should have been. I felt my stomach lurch when my fist sunk through his arm and into his torso like a damn slime-filled stress ball. Except instead of alleviating stress, he made it so, so much worse. He stared at me for a moment in unimpressed silence. Ralph was a supervisor. Not only that, but I managed to piss him off twice in my first week. Needless to say, he's far from my biggest fan. He also makes me really uncomfortable. You're heading in the wrong direction. Uh, oh, really? Sheesh, I'm still getting... Turn around, three weeks, I still have no sense of direction. Typical Max! I took a step back. Well, I better be on my way now. Looks like I've got to walk to ways. I'll call for assistance. No! Lying wasn't working. Try being honest. Why is that? You're gross! Too honest. He said nothing. I mean, grossly understaffed. You look like you're barely holding on to those dang staff shortages, right? I don't want to impose. Nailed it. He continued to eyeball me for a tiny eternity. All I could do was stand there and sweat. Maybe if I don't move, he'll leave. Like a T-Rex. Unfortunately, Ralph didn't follow predatory chicken rules. He took a step back and very, very slowly started opening his mouth. It stretched and cracked like the conjuring house with osteoporosis. His teeth were rotting and twisted, and his tongue was a sickly purple color. If I wasn't running on three hours of sleep and two Red Bulls, I probably would have started screaming like a kid in a haunted Chuck E. Cheese. Just as Ralph took in an impressively deep breath to shriek or howl or whatever awful sound that supervisors make to summon managers, I saw my phone fly out of seemingly nowhere with the momentum of a bullet. It twirled wildly like an iOS throwing star and very effectively caved in the right side of Ralph's face. He fell to the floor with a tragic plopping sound that reminded me of a soggy banana peel landing in a puddle. Booyah! Fred sprung out from behind a love seat and started doing an awkward victory dance. He should have tried out for the Yankees. Hopefully, you have some reflexes to go with that throwing arm. You're lucky I don't do the same to you for running off with my phone. Ah, oh, come on, Maxie. I gotta get you moving somehow. I didn't respond. Instead, I leaned down and plucked my phone from Ralph's caved-in dome. It came free with a moist snick. Thankfully, there was no gray matter or blood, just a gross and slightly greasy film where his skin and my phone made contact. If you have to touch one more bodily secretion that isn't mine... One more time this week. Fred slowly stuck his foot into Ralph's side and laughed when the old man made a sound like a deflating sponge cake. Yeah, you get used to it. Now let's get this show back on the road. Uh, no. Okay, I need to get back to appliances where it's safe. I haven't even been over there for five minutes and Ralph was ready to hand me a pink slip from life. Fred somehow managed to blow a raspberry without his lips moving and pat my shoulder. He wishes he had the clearance to do that. All he can do is hoop and holler. Ain't that right, Ralphie? Ralph, now drooling, said nothing, and only continued to make more squishing, deflating noises. Is he okay? Oh yeah, I saw him get crushed by a shelf once. He's even been sat on by Bonnie. Still got up. He's totally fine, too. I'm sure he enjoyed getting sat on more, though. Eh? Sly dog. Wow. I know, right? It's all about that base. I respect that. It, no, no, I mean... Does he just not die, or does, does he not have bones? He looked back down at Ralph, then back at me. Well, he got something. How the hell did he get a squash-proof card? <laughs> what, you want one too? Trust me, you don't want what he's got. Right? Shit's probably terminal. What's that mean? Fred did something that looked like he was trying to shrug. Trying and failing. He also had the nerve to take another swipe at me in an attempt to grab my phone again. I jerked it away just in time and slapped his plastic hand away. If you don't cut it out... Why'd you bring me here anyway? You hate home and decor. Fred looked like he was about to say something. Seemed to buffer, then looked back down at Ralph one last time. Well, my original plan was to ask Grandpa Puddin here if he still happened to have a phone, but I doubt he'd tell us now. Guess we go to plan B. What's plan B? I asked. Fred answered this by taking another swipe at my phone. I stuck it in the air as high as I could manage. Hey, God, you're worse than a three-year-old today the hell, man? 
I've seen Brad do some pretty weird stuff, aside from the living mannequin thing. All it took was the fraction of a second for me to blink for Fred to be gone with my fucking phone again. I looked at my empty hand, then over my shoulder at him, booking it down the aisle. Before I could sputter the creative string of swears I had threaded together just for Fred's ears, the store was plunged into silence once again. It lasted a few seconds longer than before. Max, there is a call waiting for you on... The horrible sound it made was louder. So much louder this time. I slapped my hands over my ears and could feel the sound vibrating in my chest. It only lasted for a moment, but that's all it took to leave me with an annoying ringing in my ears. So that's what he meant. Now begrudgingly coming to terms that this shift was going to be a probably very dangerous trek across the store, I looked back at the now deflated Ralph. Within moments of being clocked with my phone, he looked like a snake was running around in a human suit and shed him at some point. I almost wanted to feel bad, but he was a dick, and I thought better of it. I instead opted to start going through his pockets. Let's see. Food tokens, box cutters, new blades. I'm sure those will come in handy. I had made the mistake of losing my pocket knife on my first day to the disembodied appendages that live under the shelves in aisle 12 and 16. Don't ask. That's a story for another time. I clicked up the blade, and the thing extended to almost four inches long. How many newbies like me have you used this thing on, Ralph? Because I certainly haven't seen you open any boxes. I stood, gave him one last squishy nudge with my foot, and went to go find the stupid mannequin. The home and decor department almost reminded me a bit of a decrepit thrift store. The musty smell of old used things and old used people. Ralph fit in perfectly with the washed-out background that was bathed in piss yellow, but I also couldn't help but wonder why did this side of the store look as awful as it did? There were even water stains on the fiberglass ceiling tiles way up above. Everything I've seen of the store looked awful in some capacity, but the level of awfulness here was borderline ridiculous. My job here had me stuck in a different department every shift, something referred to as a floater. Basically, I was being trained in a bit of everything. The one who hired me told me that I would have this position until I found my place. I thought that statement was strange because I was only supposed to be here for about four months. At one point, I was certain I'd stay longer. $20 an hour for a retail gig? That sounded like cake. But now I find myself wondering if I'll even last that long. You've been standing there for an awfully long time, Maxwell. The sound of a woman's voice hung itself in the air and arrested my attention. It was enough to snap me back to the moment, so hard I nearly got whiplash. Wet and broken glass crunched under my feet as I spun. I pulled out my new box cutter, holding it out in front of me like I could actually fight something if I needed to. It's Max. And a guy can't take a second to collect his thoughts? Sure you can, but standing in the middle of an aisle, muttering to yourself, might be considered a little... crazy. Wouldn't you say? A massive spider as big as a Volkswagen Beetle slowly peered over the shelves that had been covered in ugly pillows and rested atop of it. She had a shiny black body and long, sharp legs that still shimmered like obsidian spears in the low light and easily extended around 17 feet. Her eight eyes were a deep red, and her front two legs ended in unmistakably human hands with painted, manicured nails. Janice, from what I understood, is one of the vendors. She's also one of the many creatures in here I don't find myself running and screaming from, shockingly. She's just... well, she's just kind of a bitch. Considering the things that go on here, I'm not exactly concerned with what uh, people think of me, I said, slowly aiming the box cutter away. The giant arachnid almost seemed to smile smugly at me from her perch, her mandibles moving and twitching as she spoke. Oh, not enjoying your position. You seemed so enthusiastic a few weeks ago. Why in God's name do you think I would be enjoying this place? I just had a run-in with Ralph. I'll be trying to scrub from my mind for the next three weeks. They had no idea the shit I'd have to deal with a few weeks ago. This is, this is entrapment. This is illegal. Janice tapped her perfectly polished claws against the metal shelf like an irritable Disney villain, making annoying tink sounds. Still on that, are we? Not the brightest color in the box, but a busted, broke college student down on his luck with $5 to his name. People like you thrive in extreme situations. You adapt. 
not because you want to, but because you're in the unique position of not having any other choice. I don't want to adapt or change or anything. I just wanted a job. Not to end up with a new list of phobias or nearly be killed every time I clock in. 20 bucks an hour isn't worth dying for. Well, seeing as you were hired here, no one will miss you if you did bite the dust. So, make the best of the situation. Learn. Maybe bitch less. It'll make you more likable. Ouch. It's true. I know. I know it's true. But you didn't have to say it. Theta Mart, as well as being a space between, has the ability to bring out something in people they would rather not look at. It changes them into something more. She looked at a moldy pillow sitting beside her on the shelf. She huffed while pushing it away, and it went tumbling to the floor with a wet plop. More compelling, I'd say. You get to break the monotony and forget how small you are. I am perfectly comfortable with how small I am, thanks. What a winner. I'm sure your girlfriend shares the same sentiment. Was there a point to you grudge crawling up there, or are you just here to harass me? I like having the high ground, and I wanted to give you a bit of friendly advice. Well, don't leave me in suspense, Obi-Wan. Who's that? He's... Never mind. What is it? She sighed and slowly lowered herself down the shelf, creaking under her weight as she did so. She lowered her voice to a whisper. You know how they tell you to stop and smell the roses? Yeah. She reached her hand down into my apron pocket and took out one of the food tokens I had lifted from Ralph. They were made of tarnished brass. You may want to skip at this time where you're going. As for these, she examined one of them closely. Heads or tails, little bug? Uh, t tails? I said. She hummed and flicked the coin into the air. I watched the coin all-eyed as it hovered above us just a moment before she snatched it and slapped it down on the other side of her hand. I shuddered reflectively at this quick motion, then felt embarrassed for doing so. Janice seemed to grin in amusement, peeking under her hand at the coin, then extended it to me. Tails, luck sways in your favor today. Use it wisely, and you might see the end of your shift, she said. You can't really determine that with a coin. Luck isn't real. You're really going to look a giant talking spider in her face and say... She lowered her voice a few octaves and said in a universally guy voice, You know the one. Luck isn't real. She did have a point. But to accept luck was real was to accept my luck up until this point was actually kind of terrible, and I had no idea why or if I had any way to change it. Well, if luck's real, it'd be nice to catch a break. I'm not saying it is. Whatever you say, floater, she sighed, then rubbed all eight of her eyes. The mannequin wanted me to pass this on to you. She pulled out a pair of pink toucan billed flower clippers from seemingly nowhere. Go to Garden and Live Goods. He's waiting for you there. Like I said, avoid smelling the roses. She handed the clippers to me and tisked. Dumbass. Like roses specifically, or... Get to stepping. I have work to do. I eyed the clippers. They made a satisfying snipping sound when I pulled the handles. Thanks. Don't mention it. Really. In typical spider fashion, she crept back up the shelf and disappeared over the other side. Now, if every spider is as rude as she is, I don't know if I feel quite as bad as I used to, and I would bring a shoe down on them. I stuck the clippers into my apron and began to head in the direction I was pretty sure was garden. Do you ever feel like you just can't get enough caffeine to start your day? Have you ever considered upgrading your typical boring cup of joe with something more thrilling? Now introducing Hyperspace Hummingbird. Hyperspace what? A man turned towards the camera asking. He wore purple snow goggles on his head, centered over his left ear. He crossed his arms, showing off his crop top sleeveless shirt. 
Hyperspace Hummingbird, the voice repeated, the first energy drink specifically engineered to give you stamina of an intergalactic star cruiser and the hyperactivity of a hummingbird on amphetamines. One sip of this exhilarating elixir and we instantly redesigned the pyramids, decoded the mysteries of quantum physics, and beat a cheetah in a foot race, all before breakfast. But does it taste good? A green space alien pondered. Good is for mundane, monogamous mortals. This stuff tastes like a meteor shower in a blender. Bright, fizzy, unpredictable, and absolutely otherworldly. I don't know if this sounds safe, the man from before added. This time it was a farther away shot, allowing his cutoffs and high tops to be seen. Safer than licking a cosmic power popsicle, the voice boomed. Although we'll definitely advise against trying that, so just take our word for it. We test our products on only the finest and fiercest lab-grown extraterrestrial amoebas. Ditch your dull old coffee routine, leave that boring partner and grab something that'll get your molecules vibrating faster than lightning. It's not just an energy drink, it's Hyperspace Hummingbird, your ticket to light speed productivity. Feel like the hero in your very own intergalactic adventure. Mason Quinn's voice cut in. Use promo code Mason for free shipping on your first order. A cork popped. Drinks poured. Hyperspace Hummingbird. We don't do boring. A man mumbled. Now available in all reputable and some not so reputable interplanetary retail outlets. Side effects may include temporary flight, levitation, and overwhelming desire to outsmart Einstein. Do not consume while operating heavy machinery or performing delicate brain surgery. Alien amoebas were not harmed during this testing. Now available at all reputable and some not reputable interplanetary retail outlets. Yo, what's good, Masonites? Today is going to be a good day, and I know that for a fact. Strap in, because today you ain't got no idea what's about to hit you. We're planning to hook you up with some savage talk on some shenanigans in the pro wrestling world, right? But man, this thing that's popped up, it's way crazier than that. Like, epic proportions type stuff. We got the chance of a lifetime to dig into the unknown, bruh. And spoiler, it's going to set up a road trip on an epic journey of adventure. All right, guys, before we dive in, it's vital that I hit you up with some past knowledge. Otherwise, this ain't going to connect or hit you with the power punch of this crazy revelation. First things first, it's about time you got schooled on what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. No, don't get it twisted. We ain't talking about some weird new snail species or something bizarre like that, bruh. Ain't got nothing to do with a zombie ocean. Ain't got nothing to do with scrolling on your iPhone. So check this. These scrolls were found near the Dead Sea. That's where the name came from way back, bro, like 1947. So, like, most of the century ago, ain't no prank, ain't no social media stunt. Some shepherd dude stumbles across him in a cave. Yep, some real Indiana Jones shit. And, bruh, these scrolls were old as shit when they, when they found him. Almost 2,000 years old, like legit. And guess what? Most of them are like scriptures from the Bible, like, papers full of mysteries and a whole bunch of stuff that can straight up rewrite history. Historians were like tripping when they found these because they're so detailed and valuable. I guess most are currently housed in Israel, but pieces of them keep showing up elsewhere. Bro, like what? Okay, so check it out. This week, this guy, Jay Sullivan, right? Dude went ahead, slapped a picture of a Dead Sea Scroll on Reddit. Something most people never seen before. And you're thinking like, yo, Mason, so what, bro? Reddit's full of all sorts. Anyone could post there. But here's the kicker, my man. The plot twist, if you will. Despite their kind of lame quality and the fact that they're not super clear out of the blue, Dr. Owen Abelman, right, the leading expert on these scrolls, right? The guy who translated a bunch of them, this big brain, he pops in, he goes, hold up. This shit looks legit. Sullivan, get in touch with me, bro. So now you're probably wondering, like, Mason, why do I care, dude? What's that got to do with anything? Simple, answer is easy. Today or whenever it hits your feed, your boy here is going to link up with Jay Sullivan and chat him up myself. And we've got luck on our side. We'll be the ones to peep at this mystery scroll and you'll be there with us. So buckle up, squad. Let's get it. And cut. Dylan Holmes smiled. Dylan's brother, Trevor, turned off the cameras as Mason looked over at the producer. Was that good enough, Dylan? Uh, that's insanely good, Dylan said. Mason watched for a reaction, betrayed these words, but found none. 
Okay, uh, honestly, I don't think your followers give a fuck about the Dead Sea Scrolls or any of that shit, but I think you'll get mainstream attention just for going, but no one else can get a word out of the dude. My money's on you. Getting people to talk is like your superpower. Trevor ignored the two of them as he reached into a cooler and pulled out a hyperspace hummingbird. When he realized they were looking at him, he smiled, held out an energy drink. You want one? Mason shook his head. Fuck no, I don't drink that shit. And you probably shouldn't either. Dylan smiled. That's actually good. If your heart explodes, we all lose our jobs. Dylan smiled and stretched. How long's the flight? Dylan looked at the floor and then back at Mason. I don't know, like six hours? Trevor threw his hands up. Fuck it. I'm bringing the whole damn cooler. I'm going to be needing it. Like, legit, a hundo of these bad boys. Mason's private jet passed some random city, lighting the darkness 40,000 feet below them as Trevor leaned over to Dylan. Why are we doing this? Like, looking for some old people writing. Money! Jason laughed, stretching the word out. Dylan shrugged, barely looking at his brother. Sounds right. Cars, mansions, private jets don't just materialize out of nowhere, bruh. Jason added. Yeah, people care enough to watch this shit? His eyes went to the window where the city was already disappearing from below. Dylan stared at Trevor. How long have you worked here? You know, Mason's fans would tune in if you talked about the texture of dog shit. <laughs> Put that on the schedule. Let's do that. Pieces of popcorn fell to the floor as he laughed. Trevor pointed to Mason. This man wants adventure. See things no one's ever seen before. He wants to go places people dream of going. Tell him about it, because they ain't ever going to do it. He wants the selfie. Mason shook his head. Yo, you had it on point the first go round. Let's score those clicks. Shares, you know, rack up some sponsors. Stack that cash. Trevor high-fived him. Then he sat back down. Okay, so we're all on the same page. But so, you get this red sea skull, and, and like, then what? Trevor's whole body twitched as Dylan's hand slapped him on the head. Dylan paused, emphasizing each word as he said it. It's a dead sea scroll, you fuck. Like the fucking shapeshifter lizard people on Avengers? Mason adjusted in a seat. Christ, your brother is dumb as fuck, bro. For real. You sure you're blood? I mean, your, your mother wasn't having like a little extra fun with the pool boy or some shit? Trevor's middle finger shot up, but Dylan ignored them both. We only got about 10 minutes till we start descending, so let's concentrate for a minute. Dylan pulled his phone out and scrolled through the notes. I read the rest of the comments from Dr. Owen Abelman on the Reddit page. From what he can make out in the pic, he's convinced the scroll is called Celestial Struggle, Seraph and Shadim. The, the fucking what? Trevor said, but no one paid any attention to him. Dylan continued. Abelman is in Michigan right now, so if all else fails, we can go there. But my contacts say this Janice Sullivan guy is still at the church, so that's where we start. We can go tonight, and go tomorrow, whatever. Doesn't seem like he's going anywhere. Wow, still there, huh? All right. Night's perfect. Let's roll, figure out where the scroll's at. Trevor yawned. A night. Ah, uh, fuck. I mean, one of those hummingbirds. Mason stared at him. Those aren't for you, see? He picked one out of the cooler and pointed to the words, We don't do boring. I'm just playing, bruh. I need you awake tonight. Hit this. But Mason tossed him a hummingbird. Yo, 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 it's nine in the evening and your boy Mason Quinn's posted up here in Norfolk, Virginia. I'm hearing that this guy, Jay Sullivan, has locked himself up in this church for a wild four-day stretch, praying nonstop, no breaks, not even to, like, hit the bathroom. I seriously don't know if my man had anything to eat. He hasn't opened his mouth to anyone, priests or staff included. Nothing but prayer comes out of this dude. But just watch. I'm going to switch up that routine. You better believe Jay Sullivan's going to do more than pray. I'm not leaving till he hands over that scroll, bro. Mason stood up and ran up the steps to the basilica. Let's fucking go! He threw open the oversized red door as Trevor followed him with the camera. 
A head in the third pew from the altar, a man knelt simultaneously shrouded in the shadows and oddly illuminated. Mason sauntered up the aisle, slightly distracted by the architectural beauty around him. Lavishly decorated pillars stretched towards the vaulting ceiling. Murals and stained glass threw bright, rich colors at the floor. Might be time to redo the crib. In a big window like that with me diving off the top rope into a can of hummingbird, he smiled, telling himself to remember and to use it on the show sometime. Mason approached the man and watched him for a second. He turned and raised both eyebrows to Trevor and Dylan. Mason looked directly into Trevor's camera and put his hands together to mock prey along with Jay Sullivan. The trio tried not to laugh as they neared the man. Sullivan looked up at Mason momentarily. He bore an almost unholy twinkle in his gaze, resonating wicked delight. It sparkled within the ice-cold indigo irises that stared unblinking at the altar before him. Damn, I need to get that look down when I'm cutting promos on people. Mason put his hands in his pocket, one playing with the hyperspace hummingbird he had stashed in there. The popular vlogger leaned in. Mr. Sullivan, do you mind if we speak for a moment? No response came. Sullivan neither looked in Mason's direction nor stopped praying, his lips forming whispers of words and letting them disappear into the thick air around him. Mason rolled his shoulders, winked at the camera and said, Yo, Mr. Sullivan, super stoked to meet you, bro. I was hoping that we could rap a bit about the scroll, the celestial struggle between Sarah... Fan... Cellophane... Seraph... The man's hands unclasped and one smacked Jason's chest with lightning precision. Jason stumbled back one step. Sullivan's hands were back together as, as though they hadn't moved. Jason sighed. Yo, dude, don't even think about laying another hand on me. That's not the game we're in right now, right? Mason opened his phone and scrolled through his pictures. Moving on. This is the picture you loaded to Reddit. Sullivan's hand slowly turned until his blue eyes were locked on the screen. The quiet ambience of the church was abruptly shattered as the man let loose a scream of sheer terror. His voice rang out sharply, echoing within the grand cathedral like a gunshot. Birds perched on the rafters burst in a chaotic flight. A tinge of panic and genuine fear caused a chill to settle in the air. Fueled by terrified adrenaline, Jay Sullivan struck out, his knuckles connecting with Mason's flesh. The telltale sharp crack of Mason's phone against the stone floor was drowned out by Trevor and Dylan yelling in unison. The screams bounced off the stone wall in waves of desperate, unadulterated fright. Mason grabbed the phone and shoved it into Sullivan's face, his forearm holding the other man's hand in place. I warned you, motherfucker, now look at this and you tell me what the fuck I want to know. Dylan leaned forward. Dylan leaned towards Trevor maybe edit that out. Jay Sullivan stared into the picture in front of him, a dark room with enough light to see the undecorated stone walls and modest podium on which the Seraph and Shedham scroll was centered. The rest of the room appeared empty. But it was that emptiness, not the scroll, that held Sullivan's gaze. Tears filled his eyes but did not fall. His mouth fluttered, Faster than ever with prayer, Mason released his grip. I just want to know where this is. Can you tell me that? Stop hitting me? Sullivan's head nodded, but his mouth never stopped praying. His right hand moved to his pocket. Careful, Mason, Dylan said. They watched as Sullivan removed a six-inch antique skeleton key. The iron shank was worn. The two teeth had tiny pox and slight discoloration from use. The rounded head had some sort of ornate engraving pattern that Mason couldn't make out. Jace held the key in front of his face, his mouth still moving with prayer. He suddenly stopped and the world held still. Sullivan turned to Mason and uttered only, Matthew 18... Nine. What? Bruh, I don't know that without as much as a flinch, Jay Sullivan drove the key into the soft part of the eyelid crease at the top of his right eye. Laughter bubbled within his chest, clawing its way up his throat and out into the atmosphere around him, amidst maniacal chuckles. 
Sullivan pushed the key further into his eye. The clear, colorless membrane turned red as it mixed with blood. Sullivan twisted the key to the right, mutilating himself. His pupil rent splattered from the top to the bottom as the key ripped downward, a scarlet flood cascading over his angular face, riddling it with channels of blood. Undeterred by the wrenching pain, Jace brandished his blood-soaked key and brought it to the untouched eye. He prayed with an intensifying fervor, lips forming and unforming words. He locked his remaining eye on the statue of the crucifix as his fingers found the cross hanging around his own neck. His fist tightened around the cross as he pushed the key in and opened another doorway in his skull. The man knelt back down, both frightening and pitiful, drenched in blood, sweat and pain, his chest convulsing as if it could no longer hold the torrent inside of him. The echo of his key clattered to the marble floor. It was the only sound as the three men recording him held in their screams. What the fuck was that? Trevor exclaimed finally. There had been no words, even though the three of them were alone outside the church. Money, bruh. That was money. Let's get it edited. Let's get it up now. Dylan stood silently holding the side of the church. He shook his head. You can't post that. Mason sneered. I can't not post that. The guy just ripped his own eyes out, Mason. That's what I'm saying, bro. Think of the backlash. Mason feigned crying. Think of the shares on the, on the apology video. Mason turned from Dylan to Trevor. You got all that, right? You got that? Trevor's head shook, and it wasn't just all the hummingbirds. Trevor's hands shook, and it wasn't just all the hummingbirds he'd slammed. I mean, yeah, but I can't. Mason placed one hand on each of Trevor's shoulders and looked him in the eye. Yes, you can. Yes, we will. Dylan threw up his hands. It's too far. Yes, we came too far for this. This will be huge. Dylan's body leaned forward, and Mason braced himself for a splatter if Dylan puked, but that's not what came out. Mason, we gotta get the scroll instead, okay? Those, those are the streams we need, and they'd let us keep our sponsors. Mason pointed at the church. Well, old boy in there ain't talking, so now what? Dylan nodded his head. Hang on, hang on. Trevor found something. I think, I think we do this. Mason stared at them each, his mouth hanging open, his eyes barely doing the same. And if this doesn't work, we load that. Okay, fair enough. Dylan turned to Trevor. Show him. Trevor pulled out his phone and started to scroll. When he found the pretty blonde girl with no makeup, he turned a screen so Mason could see it. Not really my type, bruh. Mason smirked. This is Jace's girlfriend, the Amish girl who broke his heart. So how's that going to help us? I'm severely doubting she has a Snapchat we can hit her up at. And if she does, he won't see it. Jace checked in at her colony when we followed her home. If he can't tell us where the scroll is, well, maybe she can. Mason reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out the hyperspace hummingbird. He handed it to Trevor. Goddamn, kid, you did good. You win one of these. Yo, Masonites, check it out. We had a bit of a plot twist meeting up with Janice Sullivan, right? We probably don't need to replay that insanity, but don't you freak. My main man Trevor stepped up, got the scoop, and thinks he can track down Elizabeth Graber. You know, that Amish chick who stood up, crushed Sullivan's heart, and bailed on him for full-body cover-ups and church services. <laughs> well, next stop, we're heading into her world. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be right into the Amish community she dipped back to post-Romspringa. Quick rewind for anyone not in the know. Rumspringa is that kind of Amish rite of passage where teens get a chance to experience the bright lights and chaos of everyday life in America. They get to taste and then have to choose. Keep the buzz of our world or cruise back to the peace and simplicity. Baffles me every time, but lots choose the latter, Elizabeth included. We'll bump into her when we get there. No spoilers, guys, and in good time. All in good time. And no need to stress about them spotting us early. Ain't like they're following me on Snapchat or nothing, right? Onwards!
the SUV traveled to the southern end of Highland Country, the lower edge of the Maple Syrup Trail, and somewhere in the middle of Virginia. Mason watched picturesque forests cut across his view of the Appalachians. Sugar bushes populated the area, and the occasional roadside stand offering vegetables at such low prices, Mason was tempted to pack the plane for the ride home. Trevor popped the top on another hyperspace hummingbird. Mason sighed. Dude, stop drinking those. You don't even know what's in them. Mason turned the can. Looks like filtered water, coconut water from concentrated citric acid, dipotassium phosphate. I don't mean the list on the can. I mean, you don't know what's actually in them. We're almost there. It should be just ahead, Dylan said. Yeah, I'm surprised the place even shows up in GPS, Mason grumbled. They parked on the edge of the community and walked towards the small store. Mason recorded everything as they walked. The area was evocatively simple, contrasting vastly from his usual constantly on-the-go lifestyle of tech, flashy gimmicks, and product placement. This world was pristine, unequivocally traditional, like something out of a movie his grandpa would have watched. The bare dirt roads unfurled between fields of verdant pastures, homes constructed with raw timber and brick chimneys, whispered of hearthside family gatherings. A few women came out of a large barn near the center of the back of town. The women had a soothing gentleness about them that exuded calm and serenity, each dressed in solid colored dresses and aprons, head covering bouncing lightly with each step. A symphony of clucks, whinnies, and lowing cattle reverberated through the fresh air. Carts laden with produce lent the ambience a colorful texture, contrasting with the unpainted exteriors of the homes. Mason wanted to live stream right then while the sun perfectly lit the area, but he knew the large man lumbering toward him was going to tell him not to. And while Mason wanted the hits, he didn't want to publicize their location unless he was sure he'd recover the scroll. The man adjusted his wide-brim hat before running a hand over each strap of his suspenders. Welcome, the man spoke kindly enough, but could not take his eyes off Mason's disheveled hair and his purple and yellow sneakers. The man smiled, pointing down. Keep your eye out for horse apples, and then wrote. Yeah, sure, the man looked at the three of them. Look about all you wish, soak it all up. Drop by the store, snag some eats if you're belly growling. Don't fuss none if you fancy taking some photos of yourselves, but... Do your best to keep me and my neighbors out of them, please. Mason turned to the others and said, Turn off your phones. It's just easier. Trevor wanted to argue, but did as he was told. As the man walked away, Mason leaned in. Don't worry. We'll get the goods tonight. There's nothing here worth showcasing right now. God damn, they work hard. Trevor muttered. Dylan nodded. Way too hard. I do that to yourself when you could be happy in a hot tub playing Rocket League or... Jumping on the jet to get some Chicago pizza. He smiled at the others. Mason stared at him. You mean my jet? Mason resumed, scanning the area for where he thought the scroll might be kept. There was no clear-cut church like he'd expected. He'd been picturing a tall steeple with an old graveyard on the side of it. You sure it's here? Trevor pointed to a nearby building with a hand-painted market sign. Has to be. That's where Sullivan checked in. As Mason entered the Amish market, it felt like he'd taken yet another step back in time. A pot-bellied stove stood in the middle of the small store. In the winter, it would have many people gathered around it, sharing stories and staying warm. The quality of each item astonished Mason, as did the relatively low numbers handwritten on the price label. A courteous man in black hat and gray shirt welcomed them and asked if it was their first time in an Amish market. When the boys confirmed, the man proceeded to tell them about everything from quilts to canned goods, to handcrafted furniture. Uh, yo, get his business card. We gotta order some of this from the crib. Trevor scanned the high-quality handcrafted rockers, bookcases, tables, desks, and even bedroom sets. Some pieces featured minimalist designs with natural finishes. I want it all. Trevor looked the man in the eye. Y'all take credit cards? The boys walked out with maple syrup, trinkets, jams, candy, and pies, Let's take it back to the car and go look around a bit more, Mason said. Just then, a young woman approached them. 
She wore her sun-kissed blonde hair and a practical bun hidden underneath a stark, unadorned white cap. Elizabeth Graber looked different than she had in the Facebook post that Jay Sullivan made. But it was her just the same. Before Mason could say anything, Elizabeth glanced around and said, I know who you are. They don't. You need to leave. Today. Let this go. The three climbed into the SUV, chowing down on some of the food they'd bought. Between bites, Mason said, No, I get it. But it's not worth getting into it with her, bruh. We're coming back tonight either way, so why waste the energy? Dylan made eye contact with Mason to the rear view. So, what's the plan? Drive up maybe a mile, hoof it back after dark? Anyone know what time they go to bed? Gotta be early, right? I'd say if we're back at 11, they'll be out. Dylan shrugged. 11? Trevor repeated. Shit, I need to drink like eight more hummingbirds. Such a fucking pussy, Jason mumbled. Let's shoot for ten so you idiot brother here could stay awake. And they started to pull out. Mason caught Elizabeth watching from a distance. She was near the biggest barn on the property. Why do you think that barn is so much bigger? That's not a barn, Dylan said. The words were muffled over the slice of friendship bread he was chewing. That's a church. You know, some communities don't have one. They just go house to house each. Mason dramatically shook his head. I'm very proud that you learned so much for this. Great work. But holy fucking shit, the church? I was looking for the church. That's the only place it would be, man. That's where we're going tonight. He pulled out his phone and hit record. So we're pretending to duck out, but I ain't stepping off. We got the scoop, no doubt. I bet it's hiding in the church. And yo, shit's about to get real. He took a bite of his second sugar cookie. Oh man, these cookies are absolute fire. If you ever find yourself around these parts, just like be sure to grab a bite. Ain't nobody sponsoring this shout out. They're just damn good. Catch you in a bit. I'm about to grab that scroll. You all are in it for the ride. The soft glow of the moon provided just enough light for the three men as they quietly crept along the outskirts of the Amish settlement. It was only now that Mason realized they should have brought darker clothes to blend in more. What do we do if we see a guard? Trevor asked. Mason glared as he surveyed his friend. You think the Amish have guards? Like, what, like, like a fucking dude in a tower ready to shoot you in the back with a bow and arrow? They're all asleep. Trevor yawned. Don't say asleep. Oh, shit again. Dylan waved them towards the former barn that now served as a church. As they reached it, Mason added... Yo, I'll tell you what we do if we run into anybody. Just pull up some Pornhub, crank the volume. They don't know what hit them. <laughs> Just run. Dylan smiled. Trevor's probably got 18 tabs open already. So he'll be in charge of that. Very funny assholes, Trevor muttered, his frazzled hair reflecting his exhaustion, his eyes struggling to stay open. We picking this door or what? Mason reached forward and turned the knob. The doors groaned under the strain of opening. Lucky they locked shit around here. Once inside, the trio turned on their phones as flashlights. The room was a study in a sparse arrangement of only what was needed. Hardwood planks stretched underfoot, creaking lightly in spots worn by countless generations. Solid oak benches served as pews, void of decorations or padding, the grain darkened by age. It was nothing like any church the group had ever seen, and the direct opposite of the cathedral they'd been to the day before. There was no stained glass, but the large windows allowed enough moonlight in for the simple lectern to be seen. Video is on. We're not messing this up. Each of the three began recording, Mason and Dylan on their phones, Trevor on his usual camera. Mason ran up to it, expecting to find the scroll just laid out waiting for him. Of course, it was not. The Bible was on display instead, open to 2 Corinthians 4. Mason ignored it and kept looking for the scroll. Dylan began videoing and waving to him. Mason quietly said, Yo, we're posted up in this wild Amish church. Or maybe the opposite of wild. We're on a mission to hunt down that scroll. You already know it's going to be stashed here somewhere. But your boy's striking out right now. No sightings yet. Trevor yawned again. Hey, cut that yawning, Trev. Perk up. I'll hook you up with 
Mason pulled out an energy drink from his sweat pocket. My last hummingbird. He turned it towards the camera, making sure the logo was visible. It's our official drink because hyperspace hummingbird don't do boring. Mason cut his feed and handed the drink to Trevor. Wake the fuck up. As Trevor cracked the hummingbird open, Dylan shined his flashlight near the back corner of the room. Stairs! Dylan kept his hand on the stone wall as the group went down the stairs. Musty, earthy aromas rode the dusty air as particles danced in the light cast by their phones. The trio found themselves in a large underground area, but the heavy darkness portrayed where the boundaries of the room were. Mason's eyes locked on the scroll not ten feet in front of him. Vindication swept over him. He laid a fist over his heart and threw back his head. You feel that, boys? Victory's here! They set up around him, trying to get good shots. But the darkness in the room seemed to swallow any light they shone. Nothing lit the way Trevor knew it should. Mason was busy running his hands over the celestial struggle, Seraph and Shadem, tracing the columns of ancient texts with his fingers. Trying to figure out what it means, Dylan said. Money. Mason smiled. Means money. It means clicks, shares, sponsors, cash. He pushed too hard on the side of the hand-carved mahogany podium, almost knocking it over. Shit. <laughs> Shaken like I had 50 hummingbirds like this motherfucker. He shook it off and posed it in front of the scroll. Livestream almost ready? No bars, Dylan said. Mason checked his own phone. Same issue. All right. Everybody film it so we can make sure we got it. We'll piece together, get it online tomorrow morning. Dylan gave him the signal, and Mason's persona came to life. Check this out! We got the scroll. Legit, dudes, straight out of the Dead Sea. This piece might just predate Jesus himself. But who knows? I'm lost when it comes to decoding it. Maybe some one of you savages out there can do it and give us a breakdown. Let me, let me get in closer. Mason focused the camera on the parchment, but it wasn't coming up well on the minuscule light. Guys, throw some light over here. Trevor walked closer, training his phone's flashlight directly on the scroll. He watched the phone's display as he sipped a hummingbird with his free hand. Although the scroll shone brighter, the light still didn't seem to illuminate anything past it, as the area ahead of him stayed dark. And then, he saw something. Mere feet from the base of the podium laid out in brilliant white salt was an intricate array of swirling symbols and lines, multiple circles overlapping one another, creating a complex cosmograph. Trevor's jaw clenched, his heartbeat thrashing in his ears. The more he raised his phone, the more clearly the outline of a gigantic spectral figure came into focus. It moved. Trevor screamed. The others looked just in time to see the hyperspace hummingbird fall from Trevor's hand and hit the floor, liquid pouring from the can into the darkness. Shit. Yo, what the fuck? Dylan and Mason each stared in disbelief as the creature. Mason yelled, Somebody better be fucking filming this! The monstrosity shifted, pulsing. Crackles of staticky white lightning popping as two massive wings unfurled from its midsection. They stretched outward as far as they could in the confines of the trap before curling back in. The liquid collided with the salt, the powder absorbing it almost instantly, the carbonation causing a bubbling reaction as the powder clumped in a semi-solid state, breaking the outer circle. Trevor pointed at the masses of salt and yelled, That's not normal! Oh, what the hell is that? I told you not to drink them! Trevor growled. You're the one pushing them all the time. Yeah, but not to you. You're my friend. Can we please focus? Dylan yelled. He took a step forward. Just as the creature stretched upwards, eyes incandescent a two-minute account surveyed the room the creature found itself in, each pupil dilated with timeless knowledge. Wings unfolded from around the being's legs. Then from its face, hundreds of luminous tendrils sprouted from its back. All six wings stretched up and outward as the energy drink began to eat at the inner salt circle. Finally free, the seraphim stood in all its glory, pausing before the trio for only the briefest of moments. Mason took two steps back, trying to get a better shot on his phone, only to realize the creature wasn't showing up on the display. Oh, what the fuck? As Mason looked up, 
Wings as sharp as diamond edges whipped forth in a lethal flourish. The bodies of his supposed friends thumped lifelessly to the floor. A fleeting spray of blood landed shortly after. Mason slumped back, his eyes watered, as a primal scream lodged itself in his throat. He turned to go up the stairs, but found himself face to face with Benio Eberson, the bishop of the church. Mason didn't know how, but he had suddenly knew the man's name and position when they'd never spoke. What did you do? Mason grabbed the man's suspenders, pleading, staring into the man's soul. I'll pay you anything you want. Just get me the fuck out of here. Benel stared past Mason, his eyes locked on the divine being, rising to its full height, the creature's lowest set of wings dragging across the floor, pushing the salt around and erasing the remnants of the magic circle that once confined it. All six wings flapped at once, sending small electrical currents coursing through the dense, dust-filled air. The seraphim pushed against the ceiling as the basement had grown too small to contain it. Mason looked into Benuel Eberson, screaming, Is that... Is that a fucking demon? Demon, angel, one or the other, the seraph or Shaddam. It doesn't matter. If one exists, the other exists. God exists. Looking upon it, you know the truth. Knowledge flooded Mason's mind. He suddenly understood things he'd never considered. That's how you baptize your community. That's how you get them to stay. You show them the truth. When you've seen with your own eyes, it's near about impossible to deny he's real. He killed my friends. It'll do for all of us. The hour's upon us. Benuel retreated up the stairs. Mason looked back at the monster. What hour? An explosion of pure light illuminated every crevice, crack, and burrow. A wave of sudden self-awareness rolled through Mason as more knowledge drove itself into his brain. Every imperfection he had, every vulnerability, glowed in his mind as ignorance turned into understanding shame and guilt. The ceiling ripped with the creature's surge and shattered into a billion wooden splinters as it escaped, leaving Mason alone with the pain of his thoughts. Mason reached the top of the stairs and ran out of the church just in time to see it happen. He dropped his phone along the way, but that no longer mattered to him. A split second of vacuum-like silence preceded an ear-shattering blast, rupturing the calm and ripping apart the solid beams of the barn. The members of the community emerged from their homes, gathering on the rubble-strewn field of splinters and shards, lost in bewilderment, gasps, and muted exclamations. They congregated in their night garments, unable to pull their gaze from the blazing body above. The end came very quickly for most. The being lowered to the ground, leveling itself with the community before spreading its great wings and slicing at the people directly in front of it. The devastating gale bore not death, but a curious grace. One by one, each villager answered a silent call, drawn towards the radiant being as though lured by invisible threads. There was no pandemonium, no fear. Only piety and acceptance as the angel touched every true believer. They departed this realm in soft tendrils of golden light. Men, women, children lifted from their positions in neat rows like Sheaves of grain, harvested by an unseen scythe. Elizabeth Graber stood next to Mason, but neither looked at the other as the angel took its place before them. Beneath Elizabeth's capped bonnet, strands of golden hair wrestled in the cool breeze as she continued to stare upon the heavenly apparition. Her cheeks burned rosy with anticipation and uncertainty as she clutched at the front of her ham-made frog. The seraphim's multitude of luminescent eyes locked onto hers, radiating an omnipotent comprehension. Its lower wings folded delicately, obscuring its lower half, another pair covering its face, unyielding sadness surging through Elizabeth's veins as tears spilled over her smooth cheeks. Not out of the devastation being left behind, but out of the sheer, overwhelming feeling of having borne witness to a heavenly grace. Finally, the seraphim unfolded its wings to reveal its towering majesty once more. And with one powerful stroke, it shot into the sky. She turned to Mason and only said, It was my pride what done it. 
but he understood. He saw everything now, as she'd put her own desires above the church, even when she'd seen the truth. Jay Sullivan had followed, begging her to leave with him. She begged for him to stay. When he couldn't, Elizabeth violated the church and took Jace to the basement. She forced the truth upon him with no regard for the consequences, hoping it would make him stay. He'd used his phone to take pictures of the creature, inadvertently photographing the scroll instead. And then he ran and ran and never looked back for her. She'd given up everything for him. I can only spend my life trying to repent. I'll never be forgiven, but it's all I can do. Elizabeth pushed past Mason, leaving him out there alone as she entered the piece of the barn that still stood. She sat on a bench and began to pray. Mason could see it. He knew she'd never be forgiven. Worse, he could see that whatever minuscule chance Elizabeth Graper had at redemption was exponentially more than he'd ever have. Nothing could save him, not the private jet, not the mansion. All the likes, shares, and comments in the world were meaningless, as was everything in his bank account. He surveyed the empty settlement and what was left of the people who had nothing and still couldn't take what they had with them. What hope was there for Mason Quinn? What he wanted more than anything was the feeling that disappeared right as the angel did, the absence of which was absolute hell. He needed it back. That feeling was the only thing that mattered. And even though he now saw that he would never get it back, he would try. He was Mason fucking Quinn. He could do anything if he tried hard enough. Mason slid onto the makeshift pew next to Elizabeth and began to pray. The envelope I found on my desk one Wednesday morning was a deep, rich violet, and the paper was soft, almost leathery, when I picked it up. In the always dim light of the newspaper office, I could see the reflective glow of gold foil letters. The text was simple. You're invited. Now, if you're anyone else, this might be a pretty cool thing to find on your desk. Nothing like an invitation to a fancy party or an exclusive club to break up your typical work day. But the sight of this envelope filled me with apprehension. An invitation is never just an invitation in Habitsville, and yet... I opened it. Inside was a metallic gold sheet of paper with scrawling, looped writing that read, A Guided Tour of the Habitsville Heart Museum. Below it was tomorrow's date, and a time, three o'clock in the afternoon. The Habitsville Heart Museum. I had never heard of such a place. I asked around the office, but everyone seemed just as clueless as I was, even Heather, who covers the arts and culture column. It was seeming more and more like a prank. After all, there was no address on the paper or the envelope. Sort of invitation doesn't include a location, so I let it sit on the corner of my desk the rest of the day. When it came time to close shop, I put it in my jacket pocket and resolved to throw it away once I got home. But like the various wrappers and loose bits of paper that also lived in my pockets, it was forgotten. So there the invitation stayed. I didn't waste time pondering it that night nor the following morning, and by the afternoon of the next day I'd just forgotten about it entirely. Until around 2.30pm, when I began to hear it. Boom, boom. At first I thought the pulse was my own. I was working on a fairly boring story at my desk, practically dozing off, when it settled lightly in my ears. A slight thumping, like a distant drum. I tried to write through it. 
Maybe I was getting another migraine and my blood pressure was high. But soon, the rhythm became distracting because of one disturbing fact. This heartbeat didn't match up with my own. It was much heavier, slow, and as I became more anxious, the dissonance between the two speeds grew. I looked around to see if anyone else seemed to be hearing it, but the few other people in the office appeared unbothered. I stood up and walked over to the office door trying to spot an outdoor concert or a car with a bone-rattling bass, but all appeared quiet out on the street. Although when I moved closer to the door, the beating in my ears grew ever so slightly louder as though coaxing me forward. I took another glance around the office. There was no suspicious glances turned my way. I could see through the glass that my boss was stuck in another all-day meeting. And so I slipped out the office door. Walking through the streets of Habitsville was a trial and error. As I lurched forward towards the sound, the drumming pulse led me down alleyways and past unfamiliar shops and houses, growing quieter with each wrong turn and louder with every one that got me closer to... Well... I wasn't sure what. Eventually, I ended up at an impasse. The beating was at its loudest volume yet, but there was nowhere else to go. I, I, was, I was cornered in a truly decrepit section of town. I half expected tumbleweeds to come rolling by, and the drumming in my head had faced me with two unappealing options. On the left was what seemed to be an old hat shop. Not old like the 1950s, old like the 1850s. There were dusty hats stuffed with feathers and taxidermied animals behind a filthy pane of glass. And on the right was an ice cream parlor with a shattered window and a huge novelty discolored cone out front. Neither building had lights on. Both felt supremely haunted. I sighed heavily as the pulsing continued. I leaned to the left and the sound decreased. I sighed again. Demented, ancient ice cream shop it is. But when I moved to the right, the sound went lower as well. I stared ahead for a moment, confused. It was one thing to be led here by a creepy internal beating heart, but it was another thing for it to be so anticlimactic. And then... And then... I saw it. Between the ice cream parlor and the hat shop... There was a sliver of space. It was so slight, too slight to be intended as a well-trodden passageway, and yet when I took a step towards it, the beating grew louder. I knew I shouldn't go in there. It was just wide enough for me to fit in sideways, that much I could tell, but my brain was adamant that I not attempt to scrape through. No, Sam, please don't squeeze into the tiny dark crevice where your corpse will never be found if you get stuck and die, my brain said. But it would be incredibly out of character if I start listening to my brain now. So I turned sideways and began to shuffle. The space between, to put it plainly, sucked. It was dark like the sun couldn't reach such a narrow angle, and the brick on my chest and back chilled me through to my lungs. Worse than that was what spread over my hands as I felt my way forward. A viscous fluid that seemed to cover the expanse of the alleyway. The stone scraped against me every time I breathed deeply and resorted to taking only short, shallow puffs of air. The pulsing in my ears continued strong and certain as I traveled through the slime passageway. I couldn't make out what awaited me at the end, only that the darkness gave way to a beam of white light which, unfortunately, is often what people report seeing right before they die. The alley grew just a bit narrower at the end, so I couldn't turn my head, and had to suck in my stomach and hold my breath until finally... I was birthed into a section of Habitsville I had never laid eyes on before. Huge brick walls, probably 40 feet high, surrounded the strange, secluded square. It seemed impossible that I had never noticed it before. Logically, it should be visible from just about every other part of town. There was no break in the brick that I could see besides where I stood after emerging from the crevice, as though the tight alleyway was the only entrance to get in within the brick square. And in the center of it all 
was the Habitsville Heart Museum. The building was grand in every sense. I'm no architectural expert, but it looked more like a cathedral than a museum, with ornate onion domes and towering twisted spires. It was the most impressive building I had ever seen. And there, engraved on a marble plaque over an elaborate carved oak door, was its title. The Habitsville Heart Museum. I stood there feeling absolutely minuscule in the bizarre alcove, listening hard for the heartbeat to tell me where to go next. It took only a moment for me to realize I had been standing in complete silence. I couldn't catch a single pulsing note on the breeze. Mr. Singer, a voice cut through the quiet. I turned away from the magnificent structure before me to see a man emerging from the same slight passage that I had inched through. The man was small, at least smaller than me, with a very neat appearance, a suit with a scratched patterned handkerchief in the breast pocket, groomed mustache. But he didn't seem stuffy, his eyes seemed friendly, and I finally felt my shoulders relax. The man walked over, his steps echoing strangely against the brick enclosure. He smiled. You're early! Am I? I answered, realizing I had taken neither watch nor phone with me from the newspaper office. I just came when I was... Uh, called. It was the smallest allusion to the drumming heartbeat that I dared make, lest the stranger think I was completely insane. But to my surprise, he laughed. <laughs> yes, uh, the museum can get impatient, he said. Okay, so definitely not the time to relax. I looked from the slight man to the astounding building, and my hands grew cold and clammy. You mean the pulse signal was coming from that, I asked, nodding towards the great hulking silhouette of the museum. The man chuckled, his mustache wiggling up and down as he did. <laughs> we should really walk and talk, Mr. Singer. The museum was anxious to see you, and it's best not to keep it waiting. He took off towards the tall oak door, and I scampered to keep up with him. The Habitsville Heart Museum is one of the oldest living buildings in Habitsville, he began. I was already at a loss for words. I couldn't pick which phrase was the most alarming. Living building, or one of... It's a place of artistic achievement and organic intellect. It's also extremely elusive. <laughs> Only those who've been invited are permitted to go inside. So, so far since its opening, that VIP list has included myself. I serve as the curator and our security staff. And as of a few days ago, you, Mr. Singer. He smiled like I was supposed to feel lucky, but I couldn't even muster a grimace. We'd arrived at the front doors and suddenly the man stopped. You, you don't hear the heartbeat anymore, correct? He inquired, bemused. I listened for a moment, then nodded. It isn't gone. <laughs> it's simply matched up with your own. That's how you know you're one of the fortunate souls who've arrived at the right place, at the right time, with the museum's blessing. Everyone has the same heartbeat here. He was right. The pulse was gone, but if I was quiet even held my breath, I could hear it. A second pulse, humming along with my own, the slightest throbbing echo against my ribcage. Right then, the man said before gripping the handle of the door and swinging it open, let's begin the tour. It was mysteriously magnificent. A domed, wooden ceiling painted with intricate, renaissance-style scenes that forked into multiple rounded hallways. Artwork lined the walls of various styles and content, everything from sweeping landscapes to picturesque pastorals to the bright, bold colors of the abstract. I struggled to take it all in while the curator crossed the stone floors briskly. Right then! I believe we shall start over here, he started, motioning to the tunnel on the far right before I was interrupted. Um, sir, 
The meek voice came from a very nervous-looking woman behind the desk in the center of the room. She appeared to be in her thirties, with wildly curly hair stuffed into a cap that read security in large black letters. She had several oversized computer monitors in front of her, but she was looking to the curator with worried eyes. The curator was annoyed. Not now, Kim, really. She shifted behind the desk. But, sir, she tried again, but was cut off. Kimberly, we have a guest. The man hissed through his teeth. The guard looked at him, confused. Then her eyes traveled behind him to see me. She studied my face with an odd, bewildered way, until suddenly her expression shifted to one of excitement. Mr. Singer, she exclaimed, and I wondered if everyone here mysteriously knew my name. We're all very glad you're here. Welcome to the Habitsville Heart Museum. I nodded politely, and she turned back to the curator. Hi, I'm sorry, sir, but I really do need a quick word with you. The curator sighed, mustache wiggling with agitation. Fine, but make it quick. He turned to me. My apologies, Mr. Singer. Have a look around the lobby. I'll be back in a moment. Take your time, I said. Politeness seems to be something I fall back on when completely and utterly confused. The two sequestered themselves behind the security desk as I began to stroll around the circular room. I was looking around the lobby. Sure, there was plenty to see in just half this room alone. I couldn't imagine what awaited me in each of the museum's hallways, but I was also, of course, doing my best to eavesdrop on the conversation going on in the center of the room. At first listen, it seemed to revolve around the whereabouts of the missing security guard named Humphrey. You patrolled in respiratory this morning, which was what was on the schedule, Kimberly was whispering nervously as she typed something into the computer. Yes, right? The curator hissed impatiently. And then? Well, he was supposed to go to lunch. He said he was going to lunch, so I said I would cover all factory. He, he said he was going to lunch, she repeated. And? The curator demanded. Kimberly, please stop wasting my time. Humphrey went to muscular instead. The room grew deathly quiet. I was standing in front of a painting of a family having a picnic in a meadow, trying my best to seem like staring at art rendered me deaf, though it seemed like this new information was enough to make the two museum staff forget they had a guest. Muscular. The curator repeated, his voice strangled and hoarse. Yes, sir, Kimberly answered morose. Then she clicked something on the computer. It was silent as the two watched whatever it was on the screen, but it only lasted about 20 seconds. And when it was over, the ringing silence seemed to intensify. Then the curator spoke. Right then. On with the tour. The curator strolled away from the guard behind the desk, whose fear looked not the slightest bit assuaged. He came back to me, smiling, and motioned towards the far wall. Carved into the surface was a darkened archway, the entrance to a tunnel. Above it was a plaque labeled Coronary. It's always best to start with the heart of the Habitsville Heart Museum. <laughs> Perhaps this will tell you more about why you're here. Then, the curator stood before the tunnel and crossed into the darkness without hesitation. Like a willingly swallowed sardine into a whale's open mouth. I often wonder, dear readers, if you think me brave, if, if you've read my stories, read and believed them, then you're used to hearing me justify just why I get myself into the predicaments I do, with all the mysterious creatures, places, and most horribly people that make up this town. You may think me courageous to the point of stupidity, daring to the point of arrogance, but if I was to tell you the truth, I would say that I am a supremely anxious mind, trapped inside an absurdly trusting body. So as I stood in front of this great maw of a hallway, listening to the footsteps of the curator get farther and farther away, my mind pleaded with my body, begging to turn around and leave, and yet my foot moved forward into the shadow, and soon, soon I too was inside the whale. I followed the curator into the coronary tunnel, two cells in a vein, 
and felt myself overcome with the strangest sensation in my chest. My heart was beating harder, not faster. I was afraid my pulse should have been racing, but instead it held its same steady beat and seemed to compensate by pushing large gulps of blood through my arteries like a little combustion engine in my chest. What is that? I asked, unabashedly putting my hand to my torso, horrified to find that I could feel it as well, the outline of the organ inflating and deflating at an alarming capacity. Nothing to worry about, the curator's voice drifted through the dark calmly. Completely ordinary, he continued, though the sensation felt anything but. You're in sync with the museum, which doesn't have much leniency for guests. Stay calm. You'll be fine. My chest actually hurt with the force of the blood being pushed through my veins, my heart compensating for the museum's slow pulse. And though the panic was sitting as a pit in my throat, I forced myself to take deep breaths. Slowly, the pulse returned to normal, and the straining in my chest settled to a dull ache. So bravery was a necessity to survive a trip to the Heart Museum. Not even bravery, a complete and utter apathy to give way to the will of the museum. Though my sight was limited in the dark, my sense of smell wasn't. The odor was growing stronger as we walked, a rotten, dank smell mixed with some chemical. The scent of preservation. Eventually, my nose was burning with the acrid scent, when suddenly the curator's footsteps stopped in front of me, and I too ceased moving through the black. Then, two sharp claps cut through the quiet, making my body and my heart jump painfully, and suddenly, the lights flashed on. I blinked as my pupils adjusted to the jolt of brightness. What surrounded me was a library of faces. Painted portraits on outstretched canvas covered the surrounding walls, set upon easels under spotlights, and some even were placed flat on the tall ceiling above, eyes staring from every possible direction. They were all sorts of people from all kinds of demographics, and their facial expressions were some of the oddest I'd ever seen. They were like stills from a video, complex contortions of faces captured in oil. Not the usual vacant expressions or soft smiles of other portraits I'd seen. An old woman looked tired, a young boy seemed bored. One woman appeared to be mid-sneeze and another mid-laugh. The hair, makeup, and visible clothing of each person varied in style and time period. I saw boxy glasses from the 40s, long hair from the 70s, and a teenager with headphones on. Though the subjects were odd, even I could tell these paintings were expertly done. If all done by a single artist, to fill the room would have surely taken a lifetime. Beautiful, isn't it? I'd nearly forgotten I wasn't alone. The curator stood in the center of the room, gazing at the portraits. I've seen them a thousand times, yet every encounter they take my breath away. He smiled at me. And for a moment, I actually half returned the expression, so genuine he seemed. I like to start guests off here, let them know how welcome they really are. The statement almost seemed sweet, until I really thought about it. The beauty is welcoming, you mean? I asked hesitantly. Well, yes, the curator said, but it's not what I was referring to. <laughs> I didn't respond, and he turned to me. Eyebrows raised as though I had done something he hadn't expected. You surprise me, Mr. Singer. I mean, surely you recognize them. Abbotsville isn't that large of a town. I examined the portraits more closely, trying to understand what the curator expected me to see, and then... I felt it. Familiarity, but it... It wasn't until I saw a portrait of my third grade teacher, Mrs. Devereux, that I realized what all the portraits had in common. They all depicted the contorted faces of citizens. It might have been charming if the one portrait I'd recognized hadn't been Mrs. Devereux. We're shielded from so much as children if we're lucky. That's a kind way of putting it. 
Often I wondered if it was this editing of everyday events that led me down the path of investigative journalism. I can't stand for a secret to be kept. Mrs. Devereaux was one of those secrets. She had been a kind woman in her late sixties, too passionate about teaching to retire, though perhaps that was a sugar coating too. Though memories were blurry from that age, there was no forgetting the large wire-framed squares she wore for glasses, the lenses so thick they were warped. Her eyes were made comically large, and I always thought she resembled a housefly. I could never swat them after she was gone. A series of stand-in teachers came after Miss Devereaux abruptly stopped coming to class, each telling us a different reason why the woman had disappeared. A long vacation, a bad cold, a visiting relative. Eventually, with the self-centeredness of children, we stopped asking for explanations. Now her portrait stared back at me. Lips hardened into a grim line. Her eyes... Sad, almost pitying. What is this? I asked, barely letting the question come from my throat. The curator spoke gently. This is how we choose our guests. I tore my eyes away from Mrs. Devereaux's and turned back towards my guide. His eyes mirrored hers, pitying and patient. A teacher talking to a child. I was acutely aware of the pain in my chest as my pulse strained to quicken, held back by the mysterious thrall of the museum. I was always a good student. It took only a moment more for me to understand what he was saying. I walked around the room, eyes darting frantically from frame to frame, the movement making my blood gush loudly, painfully in my ears until, of course, I found it. An ornate gold frame, orange undertone oil, so smooth it still looked wet. A young man was pictured holding a white coffee mug with a pine tree on it to his lips. Gaze cast down as though reading a newspaper or perhaps perhaps proofreading an article. I leaned in even closer. Maybe I was mistaken, but I saw the chip in the pottery rim that always threatened to cut my lip, the tiny scar on his brow from a hard childhood fall. It was a painting of me. Mr. Singer. He clearly crooned my name, so sweetly was he calling me. I tore my eyes away from my image on canvas and looked at the curator. How? He sighed and closed the gap between us, resting a hand on my shoulder as we both examined the painting. There's an element of mystery to all art, I suppose, though the museum's work holds more questions than most. I've long since given up wondering how it does what it does. More pertinent now is a different question. Why? The curator had let his simple question linger in the air as we walked through the rest of the gallery. I avoided the gazes of the portraits, trying to keep my heart from fighting the pulse of the museum, and eventually we came to a door on the far side of the hall. A word was engraved above it. Muscular. After the close and cluttered gallery, the muscular department was jarring. A cavernous room with a high domed ceiling. The layout seemed nearly impossible, as though... Both the lobby and the coronary gallery bottleneck directly into a hall larger than the building itself. Crucially adding to the eeriness, the room was completely empty. Devoid of windows, and lit only from recessed lights used sparingly. The curator and I's shadows were the only things decorating the walls. There's nothing here, I said not knowing if this was a reason to feel relieved or even more concerned. Looks to be, the curator said, 
sounding amused. But looks can be deceiving. He began walking briskly across the floor, footsteps echoing sharply. Let's walk and talk, Mr. Singer. It's best to move through muscular quickly. I matched his steps and immediately felt the strain on my heart. Are you sure we shouldn't slow down? If we get our heart rates too high, I don't know what'll happen. Heart attack, <laughs> stroke, all sorts of nasty things. The curator answered drolly. I've made this walk many, many times, I assure you. I'll keep a healthy pace. This did nothing to calm my nerves, but there wasn't much else to do besides trust the curator, at least for the time being. Now would be a great time to start explaining what the hell's going on here. I stopped in my tracks. I was so sick of such useless phrases, such non-answers. To be quite honest, I was just the wrong mixture of scared and pissed off. I'm sorry. That's not good enough. I want to know what's going on here now. I realize I'm not an especially threatening guy, but I was still surprised when the curator's stride didn't break. Not in the least. Keep moving, Mr. Singer. It's for the best. His voice drifted back to me. I had had enough. We hadn't gone very far. Surely I could remember the path back into the bizarre coronary gallery. Out of the lobby, squeeze myself back between the hat and the ice cream parlor until I was back into the familiar Habitsville I knew. I was done with mystery and cryptic conversations. It was, it was time to go home. I turned my heels to head back from where we came, and sharp pain blossomed from my nose. There was nothing before me but red, and as I blinked, I saw inexplicably blood smeared on a rust-colored brick wall that seemed to have sprung up out of nowhere. It stretched above ten feet horizontally, blocked my view of the exit, but otherwise seemed to not have a function. It absolutely had not been there only a moment ago. My one hand cupped to catch the free-flowing blood as it dribbled down my chin. The other reached out and grazed my fingertips against the rough surface of the wall. There was no question. It, it was real. I could feel the grittiness of the stone as my blood cooled on its surface. How? I called to the curator. But as I turned to look ahead to where I could still hear the footsteps of my guide... Dread coursed through me. Inches from my face where before I'd been an empty hall was instead a brick wall. Well, part of a brick wall. Impossible as it seemed, the wall appeared to be half done. I could see the binding was still wet. And it only went to my chest instead of over my head as the other one had. As though the crafter had been caught in the act. Construction interrupted. What the hell? I said, my speech garbled from the blood still flowing from my nostrils. Keep moving, Mr. Singer, the voice of the curator floating by, almost singing from much farther than it had been before. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the smallest flint of movement. I turned my head, and there was a new wall joining the first two, creating a narrow space of only about two feet. And in that moment, the mechanisms of this place was clear. Keep moving or get entombed. I bunched up my shirt by the collar and pinched my nostrils with it. A quick glance to my right told me that another wall had risen up, so the only way to move was forward. I kept my eyes wide open, afraid to blink, and hoisted myself onto the top of the wall. Ironically, I overestimated my, my own strength and lost my balance, falling from about ten feet onto the hard marble floor. The blood from my nose spattered across the floor, and for a moment, I thought I had done far worse than a simple broke nose. Blood pooled in front of me on the floor, and my head spun. I could make out the reflection on its smooth surface. No, oh, no, no, I garbled. The walls had spread like a virus across the room, each in varying stages of construction. I got to my feet as quickly as I could. My eyes roved over them quickly. It seemed that so long as I kept them locked in my gaze, they were unable to grow. I limped forward, my body sore from the fall. I was able to move around the wall directly in front of me. I was dizzy. I must have hit my head on the floor, and I lurched forward, bracing myself on the large chunk of brick in front of me, fighting to keep my eyes from clenching against the pounding in my head. I, I had to keep moving forward. 
I knew this by now, but neither of my injuries nor my urgency could keep me from noticing one terrible fact. This was not a brick. I let out an involuntary disgusted groan as I drew my hand away sharply. It came away wet. I abandoned my watching of the surrounding walls to examine what I had just incidentally grasped. There, speckled with caulk and squeezed in the center of four surrounding stone bricks, was a completely rectangular human head. It had clearly been round at one point, severed at the neck, and molded to fit the space. It had been dead for some time, though, not long enough to lose its flesh. My index finger had perforated its solid cheek, now paper-thin with time. The half-moon eyes yellowed and rotten. It hadn't been done artfully. It didn't even feel meant to scare. Organic bricks made by something that saw flesh as material. Some involuntary instinct within me kept me from getting sick. Survival was my priority, though. I wanted to look away. I kept my eyes roving over the walls as I moved, making eye contact with a large number of head bricks that were shoved amongst the real ones. Looking deeply into the sockets of the ones that already faded to bone. Where are you? I called out desperately becoming disoriented as walls behind walls cropped up. Keep moving, Mr. Singer, the curator answered to my right. I'd gotten turned around after all. He sounded despicably placid, his calmness infuriating. Keep talking, I responded. The curator obliged, opting instead for a steady hum of a dissonant melody I didn't recognize. I followed the haunting sound of his tenor, rounding corners and praying that I would have enough space to move forward through the labyrinth. Every time I blinked, it seemed more bricks were added, both flesh and otherwise. The curator was close, so close it seemed as though only one more set of walls separated us. I turned what I hoped was the final corner. A dead end. My stomach dropped. Wait, I said aloud, but it was futile. By the time I turned, my route back was walled up. I breathed as deeply as I could through my mouth, the air tasting of rust from the blood of my crusted nose. Nonetheless, my heart was hammering, fighting against the rhythm of the museum. I looked to the top of the wall, it was far too tall to make it over, and to my horror, bricks had appeared over top of me, slowly creating a ceiling. I was going to be sealed inside. I started tracing my fingers against the grout of the brick in front of me. The beams from the overhead lights were narrowing as brick upon brick spread above me. I could hear the grinding sound of them being placed, but as I looked up, I could never see the builder. I was clawing at the space between the two bricks as the final gap was closed. The curator, still humming his haunting melody, sounded submerged in water. My nails were chipping against the stone, not finding any give and beginning to panic. Then, then my fingers found something soft. I pressed against it and found the rubbery sensation of buoyant flesh. The sick feeling growing in my stomach. I was thankful there was no light to see what I had to do next. I tried to shove my sore fingers in the grooves between the head and the bricks around it, but it was, it was sealed tight. There would be no gentle shimmying the block out. I reared my fist back and let it hit. It hurt more than I thought that it would. I didn't feel any movement. I took a deep breath, backed up as best I could until my back pressed against the wall behind me. Then I kicked. It helped to picture a jack-o'-lantern. The way I would stomp out the rotting ones as a kid once Halloween had passed. The squelching, the guts of a vegetable, and the hard bits hitting the floor just seeds. Merely a pumpkin. And nothing more. Eventually, with the sound of suction and a pop... Light filtered back into the confined space that I was trapped in. The curator's humming sounded clear. I continued to knock the bricks surrounding the hole, trying not to see the bits of materials dangling from my shoes. With loud echoing cracks, the bricks fell away, and I could climb through the hole. I breathed heavily, chest aching. The curator stood by another door idly, looking mildly entertained, but otherwise unbothered. 
His humming had stopped. He glanced down at my feet and made a sound with his teeth. I looked down, too, against my best interests. It immediately diverted my eyes from the pulpy mass that once was a human head. A relatively fresh one, by the looks of it, which made everything so much worse. Poor Humphrey, the curator said, disappointed. Then he stepped swiftly through the door that read, Respiratory. And I, now knowing better than to drag behind, followed suit. We were plunged once more into darkness. The curator and I, my only guide, once again, the echoing sound of his footsteps just ahead of me, strolling confidently. I was tired, emotionally and physically, but I followed dutifully, unwilling to be left to the devices of the museum. It's not good, is it? I could have laughed at the question, as absurd as it seemed in that moment. It's horrible, I answered. The curator let out a sigh as though he was afraid that might be my answer. It wasn't always this way. Finally, I thought I might get some answers. And then I slipped. I thought my feet were sliding due to the residue of Humphrey's head on my sneakers, but as I lost my footing entirely and my hands made contact with the floor, I realized I was very wrong. The first thing I noticed was how moist it was. Not like something had spilled as my hands pressed into it. There was give, and more liquid seeped up between my fingers. I stood up carefully, trying to steady myself on the slippery surface. I could feel the wet patches on my pants where my knees had made contact. I hadn't noticed until then, but the air in this darkened hallway was stale, foul and hot, and there seemed to be a constant breeze blowing against us. So we were walking against the wind. And if I had held very, very still, I could feel it. A slight rhythmic rising and falling like the swinging of a ship. Respiratory. I couldn't see it, but I knew what surrounded the curator and I. The warm, wet bronchial flesh of lungs, expanding and contracting to match the breath of a beast of a creature. You all right? The curator's voice asked, some feet ahead of me. I didn't know how to even begin to answer the question. Respiratory takes some getting used to, but it gives us a nice time to chat. A nice time. What the hell's going on here? Why am I here? Why? What? Why, this used to be a lovely place, Mr. Singer. Breaks my heart what happened to it. And thus, the curator finally began to tell me the sorry tale of the Habitsville Heart Museum. Long ago, the Habitsville Heart Museum sat where it was meant to. In the center of Habitsville, Back when the shops this side of town were a main street, bustling with activity. The Habitsville Heart Museum was a popular spot for visitors back when strangers came into town and were welcomed in. Before Habitsville became what it is. The curator isn't sure what happened, or if there was any one cause, but gradually the businesses around the museum started closing down. The ice cream parlor, the hat shop, and the number of boarded-up shacks I passed on my way to the square, where the museum now resides. The town grew, but it grew inwards. Visitors no longer stumbled into town, and the permanent residents no longer wanted to be close to Habitsville history. In fact, they seemed to want to know as little about the town as possible. The built bakeries and tailors and groceries, newspaper offices, as a shell around the old main street, around the museum. A living tomb. It makes sense to me now, but when the curator first told me, I wasn't especially receptive. You're joking, right? 
You're telling me that everything, the missing people's portraits, the brick walls, and who knows what else in this place, it's all because the museum's business has been down? The museum is lonely, Mr. Singer. And when a creature of its age and nature is upset, it, it lashes out. He explained away the carnage like a parent making excuses for a poorly behaved child. The sticky wind continued to wail against my face, tasting rotten in my mouth and burning my nose. Okay. Fine, it's lonely. What am I supposed to do about it? I'm an old man, Mr. Singer. The curator's voice drifted back to me. I have no children, no living heirs, no one I trust. I... I haven't a soul to leave the museum to when I'm gone, and it requires very specific care. It took only a moment for me to understand what he was saying. Surely you're not asking me to take your place. The curator's voice was steady, firm, nearing parental with me too. I'm not asking, Samuel. This is something you must do. For the good of Habitsville. The museum needs visitors. At that, I stopped walking. Surely he wasn't saying what I thought he was. I can't bring people here. This thing, this thing will tear them apart. This time, the curator's footsteps stopped with mine. It's tear apart a person here or there, or tear apart the town, Samuel. What you've seen here today has been difficult for you, I know. But I assure you, it is nothing, nothing compared to what the museum can do. It gives us a gift with this restraint. Don't, don't take it for granted. Dread built in my chest, but something else too. An aching sadness. This was a responsibility I didn't ask for, but... Was it one I could turn away from? The sensation in my chest built, the back of my throat constricting. I won't do it, I said. But my voice sounded strangled and cracked. The sadness intensified, my lower lip trembled. Was I about to... Suddenly, my abrupt melancholy was interrupted by the sensation of falling. I fell to my knees again, and I heard a similar splash as the curator must have also hit the slick surface of the hall. He cursed as the floor rose again. Not gradually, but in a sharp movement upwards before shuddering back over and over again. The breath through the tunnel picked up as well, whistling dissonant tones over one another in a haunting drone. Over the din, the curator's voice shouted at me. I hope you're happy. It's crying. The journey to the far end of the respiratory department was a daunting one, and by the end, both the curator and I was soaked to the bone in pneumatic fluid and dizzy from being tossed around by the museum's sobs. But eventually we did reach a door at the end of the tunnel, and my eyes immediately flitted to the plaque above it nailed into the fleshy wall. Neurological. We paused for just a moment before the door. The sadness in my chest was subsiding into a dull ache, and the spasm of the tunnel was only slight tremors. We moved through emotions and approach logic. The curator said quietly, I suggest you do the same, Mr. Singer. I only glared at him. He had to know there was nothing logical about this. But I didn't stop him as he opened the door, and we both stepped through. The room, if, if I could call it a room, was a vignette. Its edges were murky, rippling in thick darkness, indiscernible. It could have been the size of a closet or a parking lot. There was no way to know. The curator stepped in confidently, hands clasped neatly behind his back. He walked forward under the single light that hung from the ceiling, a cage-white light bulb larger than any I had ever seen, even in street lamps. It flickered and made a light zapping sound each time the light spiked. 
I kept expecting to see the edges of the room, furniture, or anything, but even the surges of electricity revealed nothing. Stay there, Mr. Singer. The curator spoke as he walked, and I stopped. He walked only a few more feet, and as he did, the darkness rescinded. Not like fog dissipating, like a like a thousand thick tendrils tangled together, sinking back into the sea. He crept back in time with the curator's steps until finally an object was uncovered. Do you paint much, Sam? The curator stood in front of a canvas suspended on an easel. Brushes rested on the ledge. No, not, not really, I stammered. Maybe a bit when I was a kid, my, my mother liked to paint. The curator turned back to face me, a wistful smile on his face. Really? So did mine. He turned back to the canvas, letting his finger trace along the edge. His smile fell. I do hope you can help the museum, Sam. He turned to me, the zapping of the light bulb overhead illuminating his face ghoulishly, the shadows dancing harshly against the lines of his face. I told you I can't, I started to say, but the curator just shook his head, oddly peaceful. Please, if we could just get out of here, maybe once we're outside, we could find a way. You're pleading with me like I'm your captor, Sam. We're merely two ships weathering the same storm. The sea doesn't bargain. As he spoke, I could feel it. The beating in my chest starting to quicken. At first, it was a relief, the pace of the pulse finally fitting more accurately to my own, not fighting against it just for a moment, but then it quickly surpassed the realm of comfort. It was hammering against my ribs, and I knew the curator could feel it too because we were doubling over at once, hands clutching our chests. I've never had a heart attack. I'm young enough to have the luxury of not giving them much thought. But this is how I imagine it to feel, a rodent running wild in your rib cage, flurried and reckless, pulling at individual arteries, digging a home in your heart's chambers. The large light bulb over the canvas began to flicker even brighter as the curator and I fell to the floor, gasping for air. My vision began to blur, and I could see at the edge of the light there was nothing. Beyond the darkness and the flickers of lightning, there seemed to be nothing but swirling black in the room. Perhaps nothing but darkness awaited me at all. The curator's twisted face came in and out of focus, thrashing violently, saliva dripping down his cheeks and chin and pooling on the floor. A desperate, animalistic expression on his face. His lips were pulsing and sputtering the same choking sound over and over. A sort of p p p spit flecking with each utterance. I shut my eyes. I didn't want that to be the last thing I saw. And then the moment eased. Sore and raw, my heart began to settle back into a survivable rhythm. I left my eyes closed as it settled in case the sense of relief was merely death. But eventually I felt the ache radiating through my chest and I knew this couldn't be death. Surely this pain didn't follow me to the other side. So I opened my eyes. Everything was as it had been. The darkness still rippled at the edge of the room. The light bulb overhead buzzing steadily, its light shining down on the blank canvas and brushes and the curator. I knew from a distance that he was too still. When my eyes were able to focus, I could see that his jaw was slack, no longer sputtering. His eyes still open. They were red blood vessels having broken from the pressure of his pulse. I wondered absently if mine looked the same. I crawled over to him, still weak and trembling violently. Hey, I choked, my voice barely a whisper. I shook him gently. Hey. Hey, I repeated stupidly. I realized I didn't know the man's name. His head rolled loosely, but I knew it wouldn't be long before rigor mortis kicked in. The curator was dead. The curator's corpse stared at me. What now? I asked quietly. 
with no answer, of course. I looked around the room with the rippling corners of what I could see. What now? I asked louder, a bit of anger seeping in past the numbness. What do you want now? I yelled at the museum, my voice echoing. The light bulb overhead buzzed loudly, the illumination bringing my attention once more to the canvas in the corner of the room. Puh. 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 Perhaps the curator's final sputters weren't the nonsense of a dying man. This was a guided tour, after all. He managed to get out one last direction before his life's work killed him. It took everything I had to stand up. I staggered forward, closing the distance between myself and the easel. I dragged one foot, then another, over the body of the curator. I studied myself on the wood of the frame and looked at the tools before me. Blank canvas, a medium-tipped brush. A choked laugh surprised me when it emerged from my throat. There's no paint, I muttered. Then louder, there's no paint. <laughs> I laughed more, the spastic nature hurting my already burning chest. The curator was dead. I was soaked with slowly dying pneumatic fluid. I had to create a piece of art to appease a sentient museum. The thing hasn't given me anything to work with. At that moment, it was the funniest thing I'd ever heard. A sound broke me from my delirium. It was scraping sounds from somewhere deep in the surrounding blackness. As I watched, something emerged from the swirling murk, grounding me painfully back in the reality of my situation. It was a hand. Well, it was a series of hands, clasping onto one another to form a long string. Though it only appeared in a quick burst, I could see that the entire length of it was at least ten feet. And the hands were all varying stages of decay. Some only bones, some were mottled flesh. The one on the very end was relatively fresh. I could see the veins connecting to nothing. Flex as the structure came sweeping forward and clasped itself around the curator's ankle. I said nothing. Did nothing. As a long tail of limbs dragged the body of the curator into the darkness beyond like a beast, bringing prey back to its den. I suddenly felt quite small. There was nothing to hide within the aura of the light overhead, and I couldn't possibly run into the darkness. Especially after that, I was frozen. A sitting duck. From the depths, there were noises, cracking, wet slaps and tearing, grinding, squelches and splatters. I couldn't say the words here what it was to hear those sounds. But I can say that when it stopped, mercifully stopped, the scraping of the hands came again. This time from my left, I braced myself to feel my weight being pulled out from under me, a grip around my ankle. You may call me a coward, but I shut my eyes again. And then I heard the slithering recede. I opened one eye, then another. The hands were nowhere to be seen, and I realized what it had been doing. It was giving me paint. Before me was a simple palette, wooden like the easel, containing several shades of color. They were earth tones, all scarlet, burnt orange, and clay. I could tell the brightest red was pure blood. The white ground bone and marrow fragments floating to the top. I picked up the palette. My hands trembling violently. The whiff of rotten rust burned my nostrils along with a strong, acrid scent coming from the yellow. Stomach bile, I assumed. And a sort of salt and pepper brown mixed with a clear, viscous fluid in a shade I recognized. I looked back to the spot on the floor where the curator's body had lain. Vomit bit at the back of my throat. 
I couldn't let myself think about what exactly had happened in the darkness beyond. Instead, I... Instead, I picked up the pallet, holding it far away from my face, and then picked up the brush. I stood in front of the blank canvas. The tendrils of black rippled around me, and I could feel my heart rate quicken. The museum was excited. So I began to paint. I'm not much of an artist. I mean, as a journalist, I create pictures with words. I knew whatever the museum wanted, it wasn't going to be the best approximation of a classic landscape. Something technical, intellectual, though... This was the Neurological Division. This is the Habitsville Heart Museum. So I painted from my bruised, aching heart. I don't recall how much time passed. The paint wasn't very cooperative. Bits of hair and bone shard getting embedded into the canvas. The bile took ages to dry, but eventually a picture took shape. Technically abysmal. Yet when I finally stepped back and revealed my work, I felt my pulse finally settle. I could feel the curiosity of the museum peak, and then... Then it settled into something else. It almost felt like when I cried in the respiratory, but different. This was a longing, yearning sort of sadness. I painted a memory... It seemed fitting for the neurological department. I was sitting at the kitchen table, a paper before me. Cheap paint scattered about. I had it all over my fingers, my brow furrowed in concentration as I painted. The sun in the corner of my work, my mother behind me, looking over my shoulder. A soft smile on her face. I couldn't be certain, but I believe that's the, that's the last time I remember painting. I used to really enjoy painting, I said to the darkness, uncertain. I'm not sure why I stopped. The darkness rippled, the emotion undetectable, and then something unexpected happened. About 15 feet away, a light turned on. At first I was frightened, though I hated the darkness around me. What horrors could illumination reveal? But as I looked, I was surprised. I began to walk gingerly towards the newly spotted light. As I approached, I could see there were paintings, not portraits, from the first room that I had entered with the curator. These were snapshots of random expressions and the smell of rot and flesh was drifted from each canvas. They were depictions of a Habitsville I had never seen before. Bright, happy, charming cobblestone streets, children peering in shop windows, and so many that I recognized as being inside the museum. One in particular, right below the hanging light bulb above, as though given a spotlight just for me to see. A woman holding her child up to see the art displayed on the museum wall. I gazed at these for a while, taking them all in, and then, with a brief buzz, another light came on. This time, back behind me, past the canvas, on the far side of the room. Under that illumination, I, I found more paintings in the same style, painted by the same hand, with the same type of subject. Nostalgic content, bustling, joyful. We continued like this, the museum and I, lights turning on one by one until the entire room, a huge grand hall, was lit in bright light. The museum's art was revealed. I examined the final painting with care, then looked around the room, aghast with what I was seeing. These, I paused, speaking carefully, these are lovely. I could feel the museum's pride bubbling up within me, my heart beating with a little more strength. I decided to push my luck a bit further. It's a shame no one gets to see them. That too, I felt in the museum's emotions. A sadness weighing the both of us down. What you've painted here, it's not really what Habitsville is anymore, I said. I felt the museum's mood dip even further. 
It, it's changed a bit out there. It seems like maybe you've been away for a while. An even sharper dip in mood. I could feel anger stirring beneath my own skin. Tears biting at the corner of my eyes. Maybe it's time you came back. I said it tentatively, nearly holding my breath. I knew what I was saying was insane, that I... I should be cursing the museum and all of its horrors, using every spare moment for escape, but the sharing of our heartbeats revealed in me an empathy I didn't know I had. I could feel the complexity of this creature, how bitter its loneliness. The museum had paused as though considering what I was suggesting. Then the entire building tilted. The breathing was knocking from my lungs as I was flung across the room, colliding hard with the sharp corners of canvases and frames. I was being thrown about violently in a rhythmic torrent of movement, right to left and back. I knew better than to think it an earthquake. An ornate wooden frame cracked beneath my chin, blood seeping from a new wound and spattering against the paintings closest to me, adding red poppies to rolling fields, roses to gardens, and then as quickly as it began, the movement ceased. I sat up, emerging from the pile of art. Despite the harsh rocking, the majority of it was unharmed. I held the collar of my shirt against the wound on my chin to stop the bleeding and looked around. There, on the far corner of the room, the last corner to be illuminated was a staircase. I climbed quickly over the scattered art, careful not to damage any as I went. I reached the stairs and climbed up them, taking one last look at the chaos below. Knowing that somewhere buried beneath the others was my own peace. Mine and the curator's. At the top of the staircase was a door with a plate above it. Lobby. I could have cried. I pushed open the door. And there I was, back where I had begun. It was disheveled now, much of the art fallen off the walls. Sculptures shattered into chunks on the floor. In the center, the security system had also been turned to ruins. Monitors toppled over, displaying nothing but static. A head popped up behind the desk. Kimberly, the security guard, her wild hair no longer contained beneath a cap, a bruise on her cheek. Has something happened? She asked. I didn't know how to answer. She looked around and then back at me. Where's the curator? I didn't know how to answer that either. Instead, I walked towards the large oak desk at the front of the building, my heart thrumming in my chest at a steady pace. Neither too fast nor too slow, I wondered. I wondered if I'd finally regained my freedom, or if I perhaps now felt as the museum did in harmony. I pulled open the door. I took a few slow steps out and was immediately assaulted with a sound I hadn't expected people. There was a, a crowd of people around the building, staring amazed at the museum. It took a few moments for me to realize we were no longer in the secluded square, past the hat shop and the ice cream parlor encased in brick walls. The museum, in incredibly, impossibly, had moved. Well, not just moved, but settled itself right on Habitsville's main strip. I took a few more steps out. Another thing became clear to me. The museum hadn't waited for a vacancy to open up in the street. Instead, it had planted itself directly onto another building. If memory served, it was an apartment complex. Rubble surrounded the edges of the museum and blood seeped out from its foundation. And yet, my heart soared. I felt elated. No longer was the museum trapped within these brick walls. No longer did it only have its own twisted heart for company. There were people. People. A rhythm filled the street as the hearts of Habitsville citizens settled into one pulse. And one by one, the people entered the Habitsville Heart Museum. It had straightened itself up instantaneously, tidied the wreckage of the move. I, I watched as the citizens of Habitsville roamed the lobby speculated as the first few chose their passages. 
some to respiratory to muscular, circulatory. I wasn't frightened for them. The museum's rage, its fear, its loneliness, it was gone. There in the center of the lobby, protected with velvet rope, was a familiar piece. Mine, of a boy painting with his mother. I walked over to it. It had been varnished with some kind of shining chemical, and the stench of death no longer hung around it, a piece of admiration for the curator. There were footsteps beside me. I can't see, the small voice said. Hold on, a woman's voice answered. It was a young mother chasing after a boy who had scampered into the museum. He had stopped before my painting, standing on his tiptoes, trying to see. His mother approached, swept him up into her arms. There, she said lovingly. You see now? I saw. And I would continue to see as I visited the Habits Heart Museum whenever I could. There were new pieces, constantly. Depictions of modern-day Habitsville mixed in with the paintings of a forgotten town. And sometimes, if I was feeling creative or lonely, or any of those things, I could go to the very heart of the Happetsville Heart Museum, to the room and coronary that was closed to the public that was once filled with hundreds of rotting portraits. Then I would find a canvas there, and brushes, and paint. Real paint. And I'll put the colors to canvas. And I would think of the curator. Think of his mother. Think of mine. The only sound. A thousand hearts. Beating as one. Hey there, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um, organized for my own life, and Patreon subscribers, you guys who subscribe everywhere, th this, this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause. Disciple, Strategy, Wolf, Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone, Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primarch, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all you guys and everybody who's included in the description down below, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done for me, and thank you so much for being here when times get difficult and I can't always be around to make content. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. And that goes to everybody who watches these videos, that goes to everybody who's subbed here, and anybody who has <laughs> ever liked a creepypasta story ever. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.